Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. Mark didn't know his father. The phrase like an invisible shadow was always present in his life. Like most children in English families, he was raised by his mother and grandmother. They were steadfastly responsible for his upbringing and development, giving themselves to this important task unconditionally and lovingly. Even at Mark's birth, doctors told his mother Angs that it would be better to get rid of the boy so that he would not suffer in such conditions. She voiced her concerns, believing that a child with such a family situation might face problems and suffering in life. However, Angs had always wanted to raise her own child and believed that nothing should be a barrier to loving and caring for him and there were reasons to be afraid, and there were many. Margaret, Mark's grandmother, was very fond of drink. On the face of it was a fragile and kind woman, but as soon as she touched a glass, she immediately turned into a true monster, could swear like a cobbler for hours, raised her hand at her daughter, quarreled with neighbors and behaved in a way that does not befit grown-up well-mannered women. Another reason was that Ains hid from others the truth about who was the father of her young son. Angs did not like to think about her child's possible genetic disorders. She knew that one person could not solve all problems, but she was ready to do her best to find the necessary support and help. Nevertheless, somewhere deep inside she knew as a true mother that her baby should be born healthy, that he would not have any health-related problems. At least she hoped, and every night she prayed to God to help her raise a worthy man. Angs sat in her room hearing the whispers and laughter of the laboring women behind her as they accepted gifts from their loving men. Her heart thumped heavily in her chest. No one visited her or gave her gifts. Because of this, she was getting more and more upset. She tried to hold back her tears by closing her eyes and concentrated on her breathing. She realized that worrying and having nervous breakdowns was not going to help her or her future child in any way. She wanted to give him a peaceful start in this world, despite her own sadness. However, with each passing day, the negative thoughts kept coming back to her. They swirled in the girl's head like some endless cycle. The smiling neighbors reminded Anne's of her own loneliness. She could not understand why her holy state of motherhood was not valued, as well as the little lives that other women in labor carried under their hearts. But such is the fate of a single mother. No one ever came to her, visited her, or even just called to inquire about her well-being and the condition of her unborn child. The boy's labor was quite easy and quick. It should be noted that it was the first labor in the life of Angs. However, she surprisingly understood on instinct what to do and how to behave at that moment. She felt the need to control her breathing and tense her muscles. It was as if it was something she had once known. Perhaps she had seen it in some documentary on TV and was somehow able to subconsciously remember what needed to be done, but she could not remember the details. During the birth, Ain showed a high degree of awareness and the ability to listen to her own body. The midwives praised the brave and courageous mommy for a long time. A few hours later during labor, Agnes heard the blessed sound of a baby crying. This sound plunged her into joy and happiness. At last her baby was born, when Mark was born. Agnes was overjoyed. A healthy strong baby with blue eyes and blonde hair. He even cried in a special way for her. The young mother couldn't stop smiling at her baby. Now she realized that she was ready to give her whole life for him. However, the first five years of Mark's life were not as sunny as she would have liked. Mark always anxiously awaited every meeting with Grandma Margaret, even though she looked frail and petite. Her addiction to alcohol had dire consequences. Mark's grandmother immediately turned into a monster as soon as they touched a glass. Their family quarrels were always characterized by emotional intensity. When Margaret, immersed in her evening pummeling rituals, began to change right before the little boy's eyes. Her kind eyes would pour with fury into the gentle lips of a spewer or curses and insults. She was becoming unrecognizable. And this change of personality deeply hurt her loved ones. The most bitter words, however, were addressed by Margaret to her daughter, to Mark's mother. The hand that for so many years had gently drawn him into her arms suddenly rose to inflict pain. The young woman was suffering from conflicts with her mother and at the same time was in a vicious circle because she could not leave her alone in this condition. Negras witnessed these unsightly scenes and also suffered from Margaret's behavior. Her loud arguments that lasted for hours caused tension in all the immediate Negras. 
People would shut the door and turn off the lights in their apartments in an attempt to isolate themselves from this negativity, hoping that Margaret would not knock on the door today. One day Margaret went so far in her rage that she inadvertently hit little Mark in the kitchen, where they were at that moment for a few seconds. Silence reigned. The little offended toddler looked at his grandmother, not realizing what evil he had done to suffer such a punishment. In Margaret's eyes, meanwhile, the rage was changing to terror, the horror of realizing what she had done, however inadvertently, but it was she who had done it. Mark cried, and his grandmother cried, with him he from pain, and she from the realization of the worthlessness of her life. That same evening Margaret packed her things and left home. Ains, returning home, found a note from her mother. I can't control myself any longer, so I won't hurt you anymore. I have to get away from you. Of course, Agnes was upset because her mom wouldn't be around anymore. But she was also well aware that now little Mark would stop watching the horror of female alcoholism, and she herself would find it many times easier to care for one frustrated person. Certainly easier than two. Ains, deprived of help from her grandmother who could at least occasionally look after the baby, had quit her job. Now she needed more time for the baby and household chores. Working a few hours a day did not bring much money, and Mark already had to be prepared for school, so his uniform, buy no books and school supplies. The boy had to be tutored, and Angs could not imagine how she would have to tear herself apart to help her child get an education without starving to death. But for the first time in her life, fate was favorable to Angs. After two weeks of absence, Margaret returned home. It turned out that after what had happened to Mark, she had gone to a rehabilitation center and asked for help from specialists. All this time she was undergoing treatment, accepting the help of psychologists and doctors inspired by a single thought. She is doing this in order to never harm the baby again. Margaret quit alcohol to help Mark get back on his feet. Now she is ready to help him with his studies, taking him to school and meeting him on the way home. She will be a model good grandmother, even though she has never been a good mother. Together she and Angs will prepare the boy for school. The grandmother promised to take responsibility for the child's upbringing and education. Agnes, meanwhile, settled down and worked two jobs. During the day, she was a cashier at a local stall near the house, and in the evening she worked part-time as a cleaner. She was doing her best to provide her child with a happy life. Money from one place was not enough, so the girl had to work constantly to provide her family with a roof over their heads, a delicious meal and quality clothes for the child. The money was in short supply, but there was enough for everything necessary. And then came the day that changed everything. Mark got sick. At first it seemed like just a common cold. No stuffy. Sore throat. Slightly feverish. Ains decided that the child should rest for a couple of days, drink hot tea with honey, and hope that everything would go away by itself. However, a few days later his condition only worsened. Breathing became difficult. A harsh cough appeared and cramps began to engulf his body. And that's when the boy's mother decided that it was definitely time to see a doctor. The doctor who came immediately made a preliminary diagnosis of pneumonia. An X-ray was required to confirm it. This was not easy for Mark's family, given their financial situation. But they still agreed, because the child's health was worth much more than any money. The X-rays were done, and the results were more serious than anyone expected. Mark had pockets of pneumonia, and the doctors strongly recommended hospitalization. Agnes borrowed money from some friends, colleagues, and even neighbors to get Mark admitted to the hospital. The trip to the hospital was the hardest and longest of his life. Mark felt weak, but he didn't know if he could go through the ordeal to beat his illness. The days, weeks stretched slowly, but Mark was on the road to recovery. Doctors monitored his condition regularly, and gradually his lungs were cleared. It was a long and difficult fight for the baby's life. After several months, Mark finally had a positive result. His lungs recovered completely, and he was able to resume his life again. However, such severe illnesses do not pass without a trace for small children. Mark lost a lot of weight. Bags appeared under his eyes. There was constant weakness in his legs, and he began to speak softly. He was afraid that any loud sound would cause another pain in his throat. And then came the long-awaited first days of school. The children, accustomed to their usual company and living at their own pace, immediately disliked the new student named Mark. Their first impression of him was repulsive. A small guy with a skinny build and an unusual appearance that distorted his childish facial features, he didn't attract attention to himself, didn't try to be better than the others. 
Moreover, his quiet voice and insecurity only reinforced the impression of him as a weak, uninteresting and incomprehensible person. But soon the children decided that it was rather boring to talk only about the boy's appearance. And they found out one piquant detail about Mark's life. The absence of a father and a new classmate now became the basis for children's rudeness and bullying. The judgment and taunts that Mark was someone else's mistake or failure became frequent. Nibbler, your mother conceived you under a bush, they laughed. Mark, in turn, continued to be silent and patient, suppressing his emotions and only occasionally showing a slight sadness on his face. He tried to ignore the mockery and ridicule. But every time he was compared to others, something inside him fluttered, pain and frustration. He didn't understand why his father's absence was such a serious indictment on him. It wasn't his fault after all. The school years went on. Mark continued to study. Ains worked tirelessly. The boys continued to bully the boy. He was used to the constant teasing from his classmates. He was not surprised to find a piece of dirt or a toad in his backpack. Grandma Margaret didn't snap anymore. She continued to see Mark off and on from school, to do homework with him, to go for walks, and to cook dinner together for his mother, who, as always, would come home too late for the child to have a chance to talk to her. Practically all the way through fourth grade, the grandmother raised her grandson, but age made itself felt. One morning the grandmother didn't wake up. Agnes hadn't gone out to any of her chores that day, and little Mark hadn't gone to school. They sat over grandma's bed and cried quietly, hugging each other. When the doctors arrived, Angs didn't know what to do. She had no money for a decent funeral. With one last look at her mother's pale face, Angs realized that she was facing a difficult challenge. The blow of fate had come unexpectedly and mercilessly, like a winter hailstorm destroying a blooming vegetable garden, turning everything inside out the pain twisted her heart, and the fear for Mark's future made her tremble. He was just a child just starting out in this world. How could he be left alone to be torn from his childhood and transported into the cruel world of adults? Remembering the warmth and love that his grandmother tirelessly gave Mark, in the last years of her life, Angs was determined not to let her family ruin his bright future. She herself was a simple woman whose hands were used to labor and constant effort. But despite her poor savings, she possessed an incorruptible fortitude and a desire to do better. She knew that she could not stand in one place despite everything that fate had in store for her. After the death of his beloved grandmother, Mark's life became even more difficult. Every day at school turned into a real nightmare. Classmates who have long lacked any notion of compassion and respect for others began to direct all their anger and rage at the boy. Instead of supporting and understanding him, they turned the pain and sadness of a classmate into an object of their bullying. Mark's unhappiness and longing became mere entertainment for them. They mocked and taunted and humiliated the classmate. Every bad grade Mark received made them laugh and want to humiliate him even more. They did everything they could to make him feel like a total failure. But even getting good grades, Mark couldn't savor his success. Instead of support or praise the boy's classmates felt rejection and anger. How much they resented the fact that it was as if he was trying to be better than them all. Instead of being happy for him, they only tried to make Mark's life even more unbearable. And now Ains had stopped coming home altogether. When Mark went to bed she was still working, when he woke up she was gone. The woman wanted to drown her pain in endless work, running around like a squirrel in a wheel. She could not think about the death of her own mother or the condition of her own son. Mark was lucky that his grandmother taught him to cook. When he came home, he could boil his own pasta and sausages, not forgetting to leave a portion for his beloved mother. Mark was already a grown-up boy and studying in the fourth grade, he realized that his mother's condition had nothing to do with him. She was just very hurt and lonely too. But how to help her? The boy didn't know. One day, coming home from school, Mark decided to do something special. He wanted to make his mom feel cared for. He decided to make his favorite dish, apple pie. He was sure that the aroma of fresh pie would melt his mother's heart, make her stop for a moment, forget about the endless work, and enjoy the moment of a hearty and delicious dinner. Having done his homework and done the cleaning that was now his responsibility, he arranged all the necessary ingredients and set to work. All the while Mark pondered how else he could help his ma, how she could deal with her grief and loneliness. After all, he wanted to see her happy and smiling too. When the cake was already cooked in the oven, it was 11 o'clock at night. Usually at this time Ains returned home. Today was no exception, 
and it was almost Mark's only chance to talk to his mother. Taking her bags, he told her that he understood how difficult it was for her and that he was always there for her. The boy explained that his help could be with various small things, cooking, cleaning the house, or just being there to listen. Angs looked at the boy in surprise. It had been so long since she had been with her son that she had not noticed how he had gone from a small, unintelligent boy to the kind of man she prayed for at night. Angs fell on her knees in front of Mark and apologized for her behavior. Tears flowed down her cheeks. She hugged her son and told him she couldn't imagine her life without him. She was so busy with her own problems and thoughts that she couldn't. And to think that her son must be a hundred times worse off than she was. After all, he has lost not only his grandmother, but also his mother, who was away at work 24 hours a day. Angs and Mark made a pact. He goes to school on his own and does his homework. Once a week, he helps her with cleaning and dinner. She, in turn, quits her second job and devotes a little more time to herself and her son. One day, the woman came home and said that she had met a new man at work. The usual provincial dating story. He was buying groceries from her at the store and asked her when she was free. And Angs agreed to meet him the next day. Mark was surprised and a little disturbed by this news. He started asking Angs questions about the new man. But the girl herself didn't really know what to say. They didn't know each other that well. In fact, she had not talked to the man for more than a couple of minutes and only learned that his name was Dylan and he would meet Angs at the appointed time at the store. Seeing the smile on his mom's face, Mark realized that this man made his mom happy and exhaled, hoping the new acquaintance wouldn't hurt them. All the next day, the school hallway was permeated with rumors of Mark's mother's future date. The students didn't hold back their curiosity and jokingly commented on the situation disrespectfully. She doesn't know what to do. I mean, she's divorced with a trailer. Here and immediately jumps on the first man, mock classmates. Mark was greatly distressed by this attitude of others. He realized that this situation concerned only his family, and it caused unpleasant emotions in him. It was hurtful to hear the bad jokes and discussions about his mother's date. He desperately wished his classmates would show more understanding and respect for other people's family matters. But all he heard in response were insults. Mark had long since gotten used to jokes about himself, tried to put up with this fact and keep his dignity in these situations, but he could not tolerate insults against his mother. Coming to the main one outside the classroom door, he swung around and with all his might hit him in the nose with his fist. It blowed. A classmate screamed. At the noise, the teachers ran to the room and saw Mark standing, clenched fists over the boy with a broken nose. Look at that, a fatherless child growing up. They shouted in the principal's office, no man in the house, so they can't raise a boy. The teachers read it. While the principal was looking at the boy, Mark was not even given a chance to justify his behavior. No one let him get a word in edgewise or talk about what happened from his point of view. The boy was simply punished and told to bring his mother to school the next day. Mark walked out of the school building and headed for the exit with his head down. He was so upset about the situation that he didn't even look around but someone stopped him by putting their hand on his shoulder. It was mom. She looked so affectionate and tender that Mark didn't immediately dare to tell her about being called to the principal's office. When the son explained what had happened and what words were spoken to them, teachers and classmates on his mom's face, there was a very surprised expression. He told her everything as it was about how he had been insulted since the first grade, how he could be beaten after school for not having a father about the taunts for bad marks and the threats for good ones told about the kicking and swearing. For the first time in his life, he was telling his mother the whole truth about the school. Ains had no idea that such a thing could happen to her son because she always tried to give him all the quality new clothes, help in his studies. She herself worked honestly and never cheated anyone. It was amazing to her how cruel children can be and how many reasons they can think of to do someone bad. Suddenly, someone behind her back said quietly, I'll deal with this in a moment. Mark looked over his mother's shoulder and saw a tall man with long dark hair and a black shirt and pants. He told Angs to wait for him on the playground while he dealt with matters at school. Mark scrutinized the stranger, trying to figure out who he was, what he wanted. The man seemed unusually determined. His eyes glowed with confidence. Mark noticed that his mom knew the man as she nodded in agreement. Leaving his mom on the playground, Mark followed the stranger into the school. They walked silently down the hallways through groups of students who were looking at them curiously. It seemed to Mark that all eyes were on him and this mysterious man. 
Entering the principal's office, Mark saw the man sit down in the chair across from him without permission and with a nod of his head, urged him to speak. The boy had never seen people act so confidently before, and he was surprised. The stranger introduced himself as Dylan and asked the principal about the situation that had just occurred. The principal stammered and began to recount how the street kid had broken his classmate's nose for merely making a joke. When the man leaned over to Mark and asked him to tell his story, the boy experienced a mixed feeling of both fear and interest at the same time. It was curious as to why this man was interested in his life. However, it was scary to think that there might be some problems. He told everything as honestly as he could about the constant humiliation, the dislike of his classmates, and the fact that he couldn't stand it when his mother was called names. You're a real man, said Dylan, having listened to the boy's story to the end. And he also said that from today Mark does not study in this school, because now he is taken away to study in a more prestigious place with professional teachers who come to help in any situation and with adequate students who do not insult their classmates and do not humiliate for another family status. And then the man asked Mark to go outside to his mom so that she would not be bored alone. What happened, Mark? She asked curiously. Mark thought for a second before telling his mom everything that had happened. They sat on the bench and Mark began to talk about Dylan and his strange questions and even what he said about the other school. My mom listened intently and at the end she said, Mark, that was a counselor from another more prestigious school who cares about our well-being. He just wanted to know more about your life at school to help us all in creating a safe, friendly environment. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Mark felt relieved and realized that Dylan was doing this for all of them. And then his mom added that he was the exact man who wanted to meet her and was asking her out. He suggested that she pick Mark up at school in his car to make her son happy. And now, apparently, when he heard the boy's horrific story, he felt compelled to intervene. Your son, a true hero, he protected you. Dylan's voice came from behind Mark's back. Some bullies insulted you in front of him and he stood up for you. Only the headmaster didn't appreciate it and sided with those guys. That's okay. I've already arranged for you to study in a new place next week. Dylan turned to Mark. Agnes was somewhat hurt and discouraged to hear that her son had been insulted and underestimated by the headmaster. She opened her mouth to say something in response, but the words stuck in her throat. She simply could not believe that his son had been the victim of ridicule and humiliation. Dylan, Agnes' new friend, turned to her with sympathy and pride in his voice. He knew how proud the woman was of her son and he wanted to emphasize that even in such an unpleasant situation, her son had shown courage and stood up for his family's honor. It was hard for Ains to believe that her young son was capable of such actions. She had always thought of him as a quiet boy, but apparently there was a real hero languishing inside him. The woman was suddenly so warm with pride and love for her son. She realized that the school where the child was studying played the most negative role in this situation but that did not mean that she should run away from the problem and look for another place to study. Ains decided to take a different course of action. She decided that she should go to the headmaster and try to explain the situation. Perhaps the principal just didn't know all the details and made the wrong decision. The girl hoped that after carefully listening to her principal would realize that the child did not deserve punishment, but on the contrary, deserved support and encouragement for his valiant deed. She gathered herself and headed for the school. Her heart was beating faster than usual with anger and resentment that her boy had been so brazenly wronged all this time, and she had not even suspected it. She felt like a bad mother and blamed herself for never being truly present in her own son's life. But now there was determination and confidence within her. She was willing to go to any lengths to protect and support her son. The meeting with the principal did not go as smoothly as Ains had hoped, to her attempts to explain the situation. The principal only shrugged his shoulders, saying that you had already found a stepfather for your son. That's what your little man said he decided. On top of everything else, he promised to report us, and we don't forgive that. He's wrinkling his nose in resentment or jealousy, and Ang suddenly realized that it was pointless to expect kindness and understanding from children taught by such teachers. She went into the office of her son's class teacher and took all his personal belongings. As Agnes walked out of the school building, she saw her son and Dylan walking on the playground outside the school. Agnes smiled as she looked at them. She was pleased to see Mark socializing and spending time with Dylan, even though they knew each other so little. Ain slowly started to walk towards them 
enjoying the warm rays of the evening sun and thinking that Dylan was probably right that the boy should just be sent to another school. The poor kid had been humiliated enough as it was. It was time for him to learn that there was another life, where classmates did not insult each other and teachers talked good and light. When Mark and Dylan noticed her approach, they smiled at each other and whispered about something. Aang squinted her eyes, trying to guess what the two were up to, but was quickly distracted. When Mark came up to her and hugged her tightly, Aang's hugged her son back and kissed him gently on his hair. Her heart was full of gratitude that she had such a splendid son and such a wonderful friend with whom to share both joys and sorrows. Now she must be a good friend to him, too. The sound of the bell came from the school. Lessons were over. Children began to run out of the school, shouting and waving bags of shoes. Some rushed to the playground to play, others rushed home to their parents. Mark said he wanted to get out of here so he wouldn't have to see or hear any more of his classmates, who had hurt him for years. Dylan and Aynes nodded and all of them headed for the school gates. As soon as they crossed the threshold behind them, a whistle was heard. It was Mark's classmates coming out of the school. What's up, jerk? Did you find an uncle who will beat you with a belt? They shouted. Mark didn't turn around at that shout. Over the years of bullying he had learned that sometimes it was better not to react at all. Once the bullies got bored, they would immediately back off. But what would happen next, Mark certainly hadn't expected. Dylan took the car keys out of his coat pocket and pressed the button. A large black car blinked its headlights in response. The boy didn't know the make, but he thought it was the coolest and most beautiful car he had ever seen behind him. He heard admiring sighs and whispers from the bullies. Look at that car, they were saying to each other. Mark climbed into the back seat as Dylan helped him open the car door. He realized that now the bullies and those insulting him were envious of him with all their souls. He felt inside an indescribable feeling of victory and pride for himself, and for his mom, and for her new friend. He did not know what would happen next, but he realized that the hardest stage of his life was over. Well, Angs, Mark and I have a present for you, Dylan said. The woman didn't know what he was talking about. Until the car stopped in front of the restaurant, they decided to have a romantic dinner for the whole family. Perplexed, she looked at Dylan with a smile and raised her eyebrows questioningly. Mark too looked at her with a smile full of anticipation. Was this really the gift they had in mind for her? She didn't know what to say to such an offer. It had been so long since she'd been to a restaurant. And now she didn't look like a woman who was going to come to an expensive place. But pulling herself together, she agreed to go inside. The restaurant was decorated in the style of an English village. The interior lent itself to a romantic dinner and Anne's realized that her men had really made an effort for her. Mark took her mother's hand, smiled, and together they went to a vacant table, which was decorated with flowers and candles. Anne's noticed that Dylan was holding a small envelope with her name on it. He held out the gift to the woman. Mark looked at the man in surprise. He didn't know that there was a surprise planned besides a delicious dinner. When he opened the envelope, Anne smiled broadly and her eyes shone. It was three theater tickets for Saturday night's Scarlet Sales. One of the best love stories ever told, according to Ains. I'm inviting you two to the theater, Dylan said hopefully. They were front row tickets. And the woman had a couple of days to prepare for the event. When everyone was finally seated at the table, the waiter brought out three sets of menus where one could find varied and unique dishes from different cuisines of the world. Ains and Mark were eager to explore the cuisine. But Dylan seemed to have been to this place often, because he didn't even bother to choose and said that he already knew what he wanted to order. Every dish that the waiters brought that evening was so exquisite and beautifully decorated that little Mark's surprise was unparalleled. Elegant appetizers, fresh, delicate salads, dazzlingly juicy steak. All of it had impeccable taste and flavor. The boy had never been to an establishment like this before. He couldn't even imagine how beautiful different dishes could be served. However, the real highlight of the evening were the desserts, a variety of exquisite desserts, which seemed like a work of art, impressed even the adults. Airy macarons, delicate set chocolate fountain. Each dessert proved to be amazing and unforgettable. Mark laughed and clapped every time the waiter served them a new dish. As the evening came to an end, Angs thanked Dylan profusely. He of course offered to drive them home, but the girl hesitated a little. Then Mark said that he would like to take another ride in such a nice car if it was okay with his mother. And the woman melted at his request. Today she couldn't refuse her child anything. In the evening, left alone, 
Mark and his mom sat down at the table to talk about the day the boy had spent was thoughtful, though his face showed excitement. He gently told his mom about his classmates and the rudeness he had experienced at school. Mark described situations when the boys made fun of him, first clinging to his appearance and then to the fact that he was growing up without a father. His mother listened to her son with pain and anger in her heart. She realized how important it was for a child to have support and understanding at times like these. She promised that someday she would tell her son why it was just the two of them, why he didn't have a daddy to help him. Seeing how upset his mom was, Mark said he would listen to her when she was ready. But they spent more time talking about Dylan. Her son had been pleasantly surprised when he met the man for the first time. He turned out to be a kind and considerate man who took an interest in Mark's life. He very much appreciated Dylan's act of standing up for the boy at school. The boy really liked his mom's new friend and didn't mind spending more time with him. His mom smiled as she saw her son's happy face. She was glad that Mark had found a friend with whom he could communicate and share his feelings. Dylan had become not only a support for her, but also for Mark. Now Ains was sure she hadn't made a mistake. Agreeing to go on a date with a man she was seeing for the first time in her life, she was sure that he would be able to give her and Mark the love and care they needed. Mark spent the next day at home alone. While his mother was at work, yellow leaves were falling outside the window, creating a cozy atmosphere inside the house. Mark, leaving his favorite warm sweater, sat on the couch with a book. He immersed himself in the fascinating world of words and didn't notice how several hours flew by. The boy had always loved to read. He had no real live friends, so he looked for them among book characters. There were brave Peter Pan, Sherlock Holmes, and willful Tom Sawyer. Reaching the end of the next chapter of the book about the girl, the wizard Mark got up and went to the kitchen to make himself something to eat. He opened the refrigerator and found fresh vegetables and cheese. The boy made himself a salad and cut sandwiches. In the evening he would prepare a full dinner for his mom's arrival. In the meantime, he wanted to enjoy his childhood and the loneliness in which he had managed to find himself again. A walk in the fresh air. That's what Mark wanted after lunch. Taking a hat and a worn jacket, he went outside. Multicolored leaves lay everywhere. The sun was gently tinkling in the empty sky. Mark enjoyed the silence that accompanied him as he strolled through the picturesque park near his home. His footsteps rustled quietly on the carpet of yellow fall leaves. The air was filled with fresh fragrant warmth that warms the soul. The little explorer looked at each leaf with interest, pressing it to his face to feel the texture and smell, as if penetrating into the very essence of autumn. He watched the colors of nature transform the leaves into a work of art. The breeze playfully stroked the boy's cheeks and whispered quiet stories that were only available on fall days. He listened to the birdsong that seemed like music to his ears. Every note, every trill, every whistle carried a bit of mystery and wonder. The boy dreamed of flying with the birds, of sharing their freedom. That long-forgotten feeling of lightness, he enjoyed every minute of this beautiful day. People of different ages, nationalities and professions were passing around. The boy looked at them curiously, sitting on a bench near the fountain. He saw how people's faces were filled with determination and perseverance and didn't understand why none of them could stop and just smile at such a nice day. The warm sun, the lower wind, the beautiful leaves and the birds calling. Many stories that melted into the eyes of adults ran through his imagination. He envisioned one man as a superhero another an adventurer. There's that grandmother baking the most delicious pies, and that one knitting the softest socks. When it started to blow his nose, Mark decided it was time to go home. Evening came without a trace. It's time to cook dinner. The boy began to notice the pizza dough, laying out the ingredients on it. Mark felt like a real culinary artist. When his mother returned from work, the house was filled with a pleasant aroma. Mark sat her down at the table and told her about his interesting day hearing the amazing stories and deciding to support her son. The woman also began to tell him about herself. Today was a busy day in our store, began Ains, looking at her son's shot hair. We took in so many customers that I almost forgot to count them. Mark smiled. He was overcome with enthusiasm. He asked questions about their appearance, about what they were buying. What color were their umbrellas? Ains laughed at such amusing questions. She was happy that they could once again talk openly with her child about anything that came to mind. And what else was their mommy? Asked the boy with eyes full of admiration. Then the woman started talking about the new toys that had been brought into their stall this week about bears, dolls and cars. 
It turned out that one of the cars was even the same model as the one Dylan was driving. It was as if the boy was in a fairy tale as he listened. He'd imagined a stall filled with smiling adults and children, excited about their new purchases. Mother and son sat enjoying these moments they shared, and Angs, knowing that her story filled her son's heart with delight and joy was happy. She promised her son that they would spend tomorrow together. The boy closed his eyes and started counting sheep before going to sleep, hoping that the night would soon be over and he would be able to talk to his mother again. The rain that had been falling since morning did not upset Mark. He and his mother decided to make the day worthwhile by going shopping in town. All the shop windows shone and sparkling mannequins beckoned to them. Agnes wanted to find a new dress suitable for the upcoming trip to the theater. After looking in several stores, she saw a blue tight-fitting dress decorated with white embroidery. Mark was so impressed when he saw her mother in it that Ains decided to buy it for sure. She looked fabulous, and her son's opinion was decisive for her. Mark himself wasn't left out either. His mom bought him a jacket that emphasized his style and added to his self-confidence. Mark felt like a real gentleman in a new suit and was ready to do everything to protect and defend his mom. After a long shopping session, they decided to take a walk around the city despite the rain. Agnes always carried a folding umbrella in her purse. It was enough for the two of them. The tantalizing, fresh air and the smells of city life surrounded them. Mark and his mom were enjoying every moment, not paying attention to the weather. Suddenly, they saw a familiar face on the street corner. It was Dylan. He was in a big hurry to get somewhere. He was on foot, his shirt and pants were extorted. But it was clear that he simply had no time to change his clothes. He was talking on the phone as he walked and his face was worried. Mark wanted to call out to him, but Ang said he shouldn't. He was in a hurry somewhere with such a serious look. She was sure that Dylan had reasons for this behavior. In the evening, Ang spent many hours immersed in a long conversation on the telephone. Between long periods of silence, she let out sighs and groaned with inner pain. On the other side of the phone was Dylan. He was recounting a disturbing situation that had occurred at the school where he worked as a counselor for one of the boys he was supervising. Suddenly, his mother had died and the boy had been left an orphan. Ains was deeply moved by this story. Her heart was pierced with sadness and compassion. She realized that this little boy had to cope with such a huge loss, realized that his whole life had been turned upside down. He was now left alone and defenseless. This boy went to the same school where Mark was to go from Monday. Ains was very worried about the fate of the child and how her own son would react. Mark's reaction, as Dylan had said, could now be unpredictable to the point that Mark would unknowingly take out his anger on the boy. Dylan promised the woman to keep an eye on her son's behavior and gently guide him to learn, to socialize in his new society. The woman did not tell her son about what had happened for fear of spoiling her first impression of the new place. Besides, she was afraid of breaking their still fragile bond with Dylan. The boy was still so little acquainted with the man that any wrong action, Ang's thought, would lead to a quarrel or misunderstanding. She would not want to lose the man she had just met. But she knew for sure that no matter what, she would stay by her child's side. The next evening passed quietly. Mark was preparing assignments for the new school and doing the homework he was supposed to turn in with the rest of the class. Ang's was at work. She barely had time to run home after her shift. Dylan called and said that he had already arrived at the house and was waiting for them. The woman quickly began to get ready. She curled her curls, did her makeup, and put on the blue dress she and her son had picked out at the store. Mark, on the other hand, wore a white shirt, black pants, and a new jacket. He looked very elegant in his suit, and it made his mother smile. She was looking at a boy who was about to grow up. Therefore, spending as much time with him as possible was her happiness. Arriving at the theater, they found themselves surrounded by an atmosphere of excited anticipation. It turns out that the tickets were not for a simple performance, but for the premiere. A troupe from another city, famous all over the world, was coming to the theater. The performance began, and the actors demonstrated a magnificent game, transporting the audience into the wonderful world of Scarlet Sails. The whole production was so vivid, emotional and mesmerizing that it left an unforgettable impression on the whole trinity. Not only Dylan, but also Agnes and her son were enraptured by the piece and the acting. They avidly absorbed every moment of the performance, savoring the beauty and depth of the story. All the performers were of the highest caliber. 
they manage to convey emotions and transport the audience into the world of fairy tale and fantasy. Mark had been to the theater before, but all the productions before seemed boring and incomprehensible to him. But this performance managed to mesmerize the child, and he watched for two hours how the story of the heroes on the stage was developing rapidly. Each of them had their own experiences and emotions that evening, but together they shared common impressions. What made this performance special and meaningful for the whole trio? At the end of the performance, all the people in the theater stood and showed their gratitude to the performers. The premiere caused a flurry of applause. It shook to the core of every spectator in the hall. And even the actors themselves did not expect such an emotional reaction of the audience. Returning home, after a wonderful evening at the theater, they continued to discuss everything they saw and felt. Mark said that in his literature class, he would tell about his trip to the theater and advise all his new classmates to visit Scarlet Sales, as long as such a famous troupe is in their town. A new week has started and Mark is off to a new school. It was unexpected and a little exciting, especially in the middle of the school year. The boy felt the weight on his shoulders, the fear of facing misunderstandings and misconceptions about himself again. However, Mark did not give up in the face of these uncertain feelings and walked boldly into his new classroom. His heart beat harder as he crossed the threshold of the door. It was scary to start getting acquainted again and even just saying hello to his new classmates, but the negative thoughts gradually receded, replaced by the hope that this school might be the exception to the place where Mark would be accepted as he was. When one of his new classmates offered Mark a seat next to him, the boy realized that the new school was indeed different from the old one. The new desk mate's name was Alan. He had blue eyes, blonde, shot hair, and slightly protruding teeth, because of which Alan resembled a golfer. A slender girl with deep looking, bright blue eyes entered the office. Her red hair fell lightly over her shoulders, creating a slight aura of mystery. Upon seeing the new student, she smiled gently and introduced herself quietly. Elizabeth, with a tinge of slight confusion on her face, shook the boy's hand delicately, conveying the warmth of her soul to him. The class stood up, reading their classroom teacher. Mark remained seated as if mesmerized by the teacher's image. Her charm and beauty seemed to attract his attention. Her every movement, every pose expressed a natural charm that promised not only instruction, but inspiration as well. The mere appearance of the teacher awakened in the boy a thirst for knowledge and a desire to be better. You need to get up, whispered his desk neighbor. Mark shook his head, trying to push his thoughts away, and stood up. The girls in the class jiggled, and Mark was uncomfortable with the memory of the last class. He could almost hear the taunts from his new classmates about his appearance, his family, and his mom. The boy was prepared for the fact that nothing would change with the transition to the new school, and that it was for nothing that he expected anything good at all. Elizabeth invited Mark to come to the blackboard and introduce himself to the whole class. She asked the boy to tell her about himself and his family, and barely had he turned to face his new classmates. Fear seized him again. His head began to spin and his legs seemed so weak, as if they couldn't hold Mark up. A whisper went around the classroom, and Mark thought it was the boys discussing him, and he clenched his fists. Mark, don't be afraid, we just want to get to know you, the class teacher said gently, and he took one look at her and exhaled and told it like it was, and about his mother and his grandmother and his illness and his father's absence. He told it as if his heart was aching and his soul was begging for warmth and hugs. By the time Mark finished, his eyes had already filled with tears. He anticipated the laughter of his new classmates and prepared to hear more insults directed at him. But Mark was pleasantly surprised to hear that none of his classmates took offense to him. On the contrary, everyone took Mark's side and expressed their support. Someone felt sorry for him, saying that the boy had been through a lot. Someone wanted to cheer him up saying that the worst was definitely over. This was unexpected for him, considering that earlier in school, he had often faced unpleasant situations and bullying from his fellow students. At this moment, Mark realized that he had found real support in the face of the guys. These were the people with whom he would be able to share his thoughts in the future, do homework together, go for visits or walks. He looked at the faces of the guys sitting in front of him and noticed how different they all looked. No one wore a uniform, Everyone was wearing different clothes. Some sat in a shirt, some in a sweatshirt, some in a t-shirt. The clothes of these guys were simple and did not stand out, but it emphasized each kid's individuality. Mark was already thinking about what he wanted to wear to school tomorrow. 
The boy decided not to draw sad memories of the past, but to focus on the future, which was brighter and more promising. During recess, the boys in the class clustered around the boy and invited him for a little tour of the school after third period. They promised to show him the cafeteria, the gym, the locker room, and even meet all the teachers. Alan, Mark's classmate, with whom they sat at the same desk. He even offered to take a walk together on the playground outside the school. After classes were over, the boy was very pleased with such a friendly mood of his peers and agreed without hesitation. When the third lesson ended and the bell rang for the big break, the boys with great passion and joy organized a tour of the school for the new classmate. They proudly showed him all the corners of the school, each room of the locker room, but Mark was especially impressed by the teachers he got to know that day. Among all the teachers Mark was especially attracted to the math teacher. He stood out from the rest, wearing a brown wool suit and large round horn-rimmed glasses. The man reminded the boy of some smart professor often seen on television, at least that's who he associated the mathematician with. Observing Charlie's behavior as he got acquainted, Mark realized that this teacher was a real master of his craft. When Mark shared his thoughts about the teacher with his classmates, all the guys supported him. It turned out that the whole class respected and enjoyed his lectures, and this created unity among the students. Mark always had an interest in reading and literature. He loved to immerse himself in the world of books and experience adventures together with the characters. That's why, when he was shown a literature teacher, Mark was simply delighted. He was younger than the rest of the teaching staff and apparently was always on the move. His clothes were also different from the usual style of teachers. A white t-shirt and white pants created a bright contrast to the gray corridors of the school. This teacher looked modern and original, and Mark liked it very much. The guys told their classmate that this teacher not only skillfully communicated with students, but also presented the material in such a way that even the most difficult works became fascinating and appealing. He met his students at their level and listened carefully to their opinions and ideas. Mark realized that this teacher was not only teaching them how to analyze texts, but also building bridges between the student and the real world. After the lessons were over, Mark and Alan, as agreed, went for a walk to the grounds, which was not far from the school. Having fun chatting, they spent time talking about their classmates, their favorite teachers, and of course about dinosaurs, which, as it turned out, were their common passion. Mark was excited to make a new acquaintance. I sensed that the friendship with Alan would be a long and interesting one. In the evening when the boy came home, his mom wasn't home yet, he sorted out the food that was left in the refrigerator and turned on the news. It was a report on what was happening in the world. The boy sat at the table looking at the screen in consternation and confusion. The screen showed stories about stray animals being thrown out on the street, people left without homes after a terrible earthquake, and many other unpleasant and frightening news stories. While watching the news, Mark thought about the meaning of life and how he could change the world for the better. In his head he thought that every person has the power to change the course of events that are talked about on TV. After all, if even he, a simple boy, can do something good for the people around him, then the path to change has already begun. The boy's thoughts scattered. The phone rang. It was mom calling. She said she would be a little late at the store and asked what of the groceries needed to be bought. The son listed a few things she needed and hummed up. He remembered that he needed to do his homework and soon ran to his room. An hour and a half later, Agnes was home. Even though it was already dark outside the window, Mark still waited for his mother and, meeting her on the doorstep, asked if she would have tea. In response, Agnes took out a cake and said that they just had to celebrate the boy's first day at the new school and discuss what had happened today. He was happy and the first thing he did was to tell his mother about his new class. He told her about his understanding classmates and how they had reacted to Mark's story about himself. He also told his mom about Elizabeth, the kind and understanding teacher who helped him get to know the new kids. Mark couldn't help but smile as he shared stories about the day with his mom. However, the most exciting part of Mark's story was the mention of a new friend named Alan. He was the very first boy in the class who had offered to befriend him by inviting him to sit at the same desk with him. Ains was delighted that her son was beginning to have friends among the class. The next day Mark woke up with a sense of determination and genuine excitement in his heart. Yesterday's news kept running through his mind, and today, Mark decided he had to do something about it. Gathering air in his chest, he pulled himself together and walked over to his classmates who had already gathered in the office. 
He stopped them and feeling his voice trembling with excitement, he proposed to hold a charity day and help the dogs from the shelter. Bewilderment and doubt appeared on the faces of his classmates. Then he shared his vision for the charity day, hoping that the boys would be able to understand him better after his explanation, and he was not mistaken. Mark could see that his classmates were beginning to take his every idea more seriously. Their looks were becoming more confident and determined by the minute. They turned to each other discussing possibilities and options. It was clear that the charity day would become a reality. Mark was filled with pride and hope that they could make the world a little better and kinder. The boy was very happy that instead of doubts and ridicule, there were now words of support and admiration. When Elizabeth entered the hall, all the children began to tell her about the charity day and asked for her help in organizing it. The teacher was delighted with the children's idea and when she heard that a new student had come up with it, she called him to the blackboard. There he again told her about his desire to help homeless animals and what he had seen on the news last night. Elizabeth thanked Mark for his big heart and suggested that he tell the whole school about the idea. The next day the class had already begun active preparations, printing out announcements and hanging them in the school hallways. The guys approached the high school students and collected money for food and medicine for the dogs from the shelter. All in one day. Shelter Outreach Day no longer seemed like just an idea Mark had. It became a real project that everyone was talking about. Each day more and more participants and supportive people showed up. A week later came the long-awaited event for all the students of the school, an excursion to the dog shelter located on the outskirts of the city. Already from the very morning, the children were in anticipation of meeting new furry friends. When they arrived at the place, they were met by the warm and caring staff of the shelter, who looked after the homeless dogs with great love. The volunteers told the children the history of the shelter about its founding and its mission to help and care for animals without shelter and love. The students were surprised and delighted to learn that thanks to dog shelters, many homeless animals find their caring owners. Not being able to stand the long wait, the boys rushed to the dogs that were in the enclosures. All day long the students walked with the dogs in the fresh air, helped the adults to wash the large animals, clean them and trim their nails. All the volunteers and shelter staff came up to Mark and personally thanked him for bringing them such a great team to help care for the dogs. Some of the kids couldn't resist the cute furry creatures and decided to take the dogs to their homes to give them a long overdue home and care. The teachers of each class called the parents of the students and asked permission. No one wanted a dog or cat, of which there were also quite a few in the shelter, to come back here again after experiencing the hope of finding a home. Returning to the city center, each student was filled with the joy of interacting with the dogs, and their visit to the dog shelter was a true celebration of kindness, love, and compassion. Passersby turned around at such a large group of schoolchildren, among whom large dogs and small puppies were already walking, and two girls were carrying kittens in their arms. When Mark came home, his mother was already waiting for him. And in the kitchen, their guest Dylan was sitting there. It turned out that he had told Ains about this big campaign that Mark had launched at the school. And now, as a psychologist, he wanted to discuss it with Mark personally. At first the boy was afraid that he would be scolded for what he had done. After all, he had never done such a thing and didn't know what the consequences were for such behavior. But Dylan began to praise the child. His face lit up with a genuine smile and his eyes lit up with grateful hope. The boy felt supported and inspired and was now ready to conquer new horizons and show the world his potential. His heart was filled with hope and determination. Mark suggested to his mom that she too take an animal from the shelter to her home. However, to Mark's surprise, Aang said that it was not the right time to get a pet. The boy was upset because he thought that a dog could be his loyal friend, companion and source of endless joy. He imagined how he would walk with his dog in the park, play with him in the fresh air and just enjoy their time together. He had even thought of a name for Rocky's future pet. Ains had always wanted a pet too. She and her son had discussed this possibility a long time ago. But now the woman realized that they didn't have enough time and resources to give the dog the care and attention it deserved. She told her son that her job now requires a lot of time and effort, and added that getting a pet in this situation would be unfair to the dog itself. The boy realized that mom was right in their current living situation, there was no room for a pet. Mark felt a heavy sense of disappointment, but he realized that this was the most sensible and responsible decision. He promised his mom that they would wait and find a better time and environment for the dog when the time was right. Mark hopes that they can make their dream a reality and find their perfect pet. 
Over the weekend, Mark enjoyed the beautiful weather, spending time with his mom and Dylan, following an easy steps through the streets of the city. They enjoyed the scenic views and birdsong that filled the air with warmth and joy. Mark marveled at this magic at every turn, watching mom and Dylan constantly talking about something, joking and laughing. He saw the unrivaled power of understanding and support between them. Mark couldn't understand his own feelings about this man. On the one hand, Dylan was an understanding man and helped Mark at school and at home. But on the other hand, the attention a mom could give her son had to share with another man. The boy was absorbed in his thoughts so deeply that he didn't immediately notice his mom's questioning look on his face. He had to excuse himself that he was only thinking about schoolwork. He couldn't admit his thoughts to his mom right now. The walk continued and they found themselves in a beautiful park. There on the green lawn they enjoyed the beautiful flowers and the scent of nature. Mark couldn't take his eyes off the monumental tree for a long time, which seemed to be a guardian of time, holding a lot of history and wisdom of age. He immediately began to make up a tale of how this mighty strong tree grew, what stories had befallen it over the years. He wanted to call his mother to tell her about his fiction, but when he returned, he didn't find her around. Mark looked around and saw that she was sitting on a bench with Dylan, talking about something. The man was holding her hand and she was smiling at that. Mark furrowed his brow and realized that he already had to fight for his own mother's attention. He figured the easiest way to solve this issue was to get his mom out of here. Ma, I want to go home. The boy mumbled, coming close to the bench. Ains was surprised by his behavior because he always liked to take long walks in the park and getting him home was a huge problem. Now he was asking to go there himself. Despite Mark's expectation, Dylan came home with him. He was worried about the boy and couldn't leave him alone. His mom had called him to come with him. When she came home, she immediately put the kettle on and invited everyone to the table. From the cupboard, she took out boxes of cookies and candy and put them on the table. Come and live with me, said Dylan, when the tea was already poured into cups and all three were sitting at the table. Ains froze and Mark almost choked on his tea when he heard such a thing. The mother looked at her son and saw that the boy was not at all happy about the suggestion. The child got up from the table and left the kitchen. Ains looked at Dylan and apologized. She didn't know what to do in such a situation, and so she followed Mark into the room. Dylan also went to the room, but did not go inside. He decided to listen to what was going on behind the door, but not to interfere with the conversation between mother and son. Ains approached the boy and asked him what had happened. His eyes were filled with excitement and worry. As he began to tell her about his fears, the boy felt deep anxiety at the thought that his mom would have no time for him. He was afraid of being left out without the support and care that was so important in his world. The words burst from his chest filling the air with an emotional onslaught. Ains listened intently, feeling his anguish and trying to understand his condition. She took his hand and told him she would always be there for him. Willing to give her time and attention to support him in his difficulties, showing the true care and love that only a parent can give. Agnes promised the boy that he would never be alone and that his feelings would always matter. Dylan knocked on the door of the room and Mark allowed him to enter. He walked over to the boy and promised him that he would never come between a mom and her child. And if Mark is scared right now, it's a very natural state of any human being. But Mark must know that Dylan is a real man and will not let either Ains or Mark feel uncomfortable around him. To ease the pressure a little, Dylan suggested that both Ains and Mark should at least visit him and see the place where he lives. But he warned that it would take half an hour, so they should think about it carefully. Ains and Mark nodded to each other and agreed to the familiarization trip. Dylan's house looked like a fortified fortress, nestled in a private area and surrounded by lots of plants and flowers. It looked like the house of the wizard from an old fairy tale. A large wooden swing stood in the courtyard. Birds could be heard flitting under the roof of the house and a huge pile of yellow leaves lay at the entrance. A clear sign that the owner of the house had recently cleaned the yard. Ains couldn't help but appreciate Dylan's gesture. She was pleased that after such a short but warm meeting, the man had offered her a place to live together and to take such good care of her child. But she also saw how serious Dylan's proposal had become for her son. Mark was used to his cozy home, friends and school. He dreaded the unknown and the loss of all his habits. Doubts hung in the air, and the girl promised Dylan to think about his proposal and once again discuss everything thoughtfully with her son. Dylan realized that Mark and Ains needed to be alone now, 
so he suggested that they take a cab home so that they could talk quietly. The whole evening was spent thinking. They talked to Mark about jealousy and trust. Mom told the boy about her love for him and her feelings for Dylan. Ains was as honest as possible with her child, so that her son would understand her correctly and make a decision he would not regret. She promised her son that they could return to their home as soon as he wanted to, and Mark agreed to try. In the morning, Ains woke up with faith in her decision. She realized that she needed to take a risk and give the new beginning a chance, deciding to trust Dylan. Ains and Mark agreed to his proposal. Mother and son set about packing their belongings. It was decided to pack only the essentials and bring the rest over time. Dresses, shirts, pants, and so on. Agnes' clothes took up only one small sports bag. The girl didn't like to keep things she didn't wear. Her son's clothes took up about the same amount of space. But to the clothes were also added toys constructor and a few of the most favorite books. Shoes for two fit into seven boxes. Textbooks, notebooks, Mark's stationery completely fit into the school backpack. The woman packed a few more necessities into bags, and she called Dylan. She and her son didn't notice that evening had already come. The man came to pick them up in his car and helped to load everything into the trunk. An hour later Mark was already arranging things in his new room. Dylan had time to prepare for him a new study table with shelves for textbooks and supplies for stationery. A large bed with a mattress again, a separate shelf for toys. A nightlight next to the bed, Dylan knew exactly what a schoolboy needed in his room. Ains, meanwhile, also had a separate room. Dylan didn't want to embarrass the girl by being pushy, but told her that she could come to his room whenever she wanted. The man helped to furnish the woman's room with everything that was required. There was a cozy leather sofa near the wall next to the window, where one could relax and enjoy the evening conversation. Opposite stood a massive wooden table. In the corner of the room was an asymmetrical shelving unit that held books and magazines, forming a small library. Next to it was a small desk equipped with a modern computer. A little farther away was a makeup table, a table with a large mirror, framed with a LED strip, which was switched on with a separate button and a large double bed. Only now Angs wondered how a simple school psychologist had such a huge house, a car, and the ability to buy new furniture for a family he barely knew. She started to worry about that, but there was a knock on the room. Dylan invited her and Mark into the kitchen for dinner. Following his invitation, she got up from the couch and followed the man. The woman involuntarily cast a glance at Dylan, caught up in her own thoughts and executed with herself for not even thinking about such matters before. She noticed his well-groomed appearance, the expensive suit clearly tailor-made that he wore to meetings, expensive car, private home richly furnished. Her doubts continued to develop and worsen. The woman watched the kitchen and felt uncomfortable. How uncomfortable it must have been for Dylan to be in her small and cramped kitchen when his own house has such a huge room. Yes, it's a real dining room. Aang started to feel angry with him and with herself, thinking that Dylan should have his own cook. The girl caught herself at this thought and was frightened. She accuses unknown to her the man who had invited them to live with the man who had looked after her so beautifully and even managed to find common ground with her son. Nevertheless, the question of abundance still interested her. She felt that her question might spoil this beautiful evening, but her curiosity did not subside. During dinner, she didn't hold back and still asked the man the question that had been troubling her. Dylan smiled, understanding the woman's doubts. A regular school psychologist wouldn't earn that much. Fortunately for Ains, it turned out that besides this job, Dylan had a lot of private clients with whom he worked both in person and online. The man made no secret of the fact that he is one of the best child psychologists in their area and was proud to say that many parents want to work with him and help their children grow up healthy. Anyway, Tomorrow Dylan and Mark had to get up early and both of them had to get used to the new schedule. They would drive to school together. Mark told his mom to sleep in and not get up in the morning to make breakfast. The woman laughed. She thanked her son for his generosity and went to her room to get ready for bed. Mark and Dylan agreed to get up at the same time on their alarm clocks and split up as well. The boy lay down in his bed and began to imagine what kind of noise his classmates and the guys from the parallel would make tomorrow when they saw that a new student was arriving with their psychologist in one car, it caused him vague feelings. He remembered well the looks and sighs of the bullies from the old school, when they'd seen Dylan's car. Envy. That's what it was, Mark realized, but on the other hand, would they start rumors about the boy that he'd only gotten into this school, 
because of his acquaintances, and whether the kids would start making humiliating jokes about his mom again. All this worried Mark, and his thoughts did not leave his head for a long time. The boy could only fall asleep after an hour, when he started counting sheep to help his body fall asleep. He dreamed colorful and mesmerizing dreams that night, a sign of a very eventful day. In the morning the boy woke up in a good mood, and the previous thoughts that had visited him that night were gone. Dylan was already waiting for him in the kitchen. There were two cups of tea, cheese sandwiches, boiled eggs and several kinds of cookies on the table. The fragrant smell of fresh sweet tea and the appetizing sight of the dishes circled the table awakened a tender feeling in the boy. He felt himself beginning to wake up fully and ready to live this new day. Mark took a quick glance around the kitchen. The light of the morning sun was already shining through the curtains. The sky was changing from gray to soft blue. Birds were singing under the window. Gradually his eyes stopped on the teddy bear he had apparently forgotten. Here yesterday Teddy had been neatly planted at the table like a real member of the family. Dylan was sitting in a chair making himself a sandwich of cheese, sausage and cucumber. It looked so appetizing that the boy felt the taste on his tongue and swallowed. Sitting down at the table Mark took a sip of fresh tea. It was the same kind of tea Mark's grandmother used to make. It was hot, but not so hot that it burned and sweet just as much as it needed to be. Dylan noticed the boy enjoying the drink made for him and smiled quietly to himself. The prolonged enjoyment of breakfast had turned the simple mealtime into a small ritual for Mark and Dylan. And so, pulling himself together, Mark turned to the man. Dylan, I'm worried about how my classmates will react to you driving me to school. Maybe they'll start talking about my mom again. The psychologist looked at the boy seriously. He had no idea that Mark had the same thoughts about the new day as he did. Even if someone starts spreading rumors about us, just tell them the truth as it is without fear or hiding anything. It's the best way to stop unpleasant conversations behind our backs, and if you find it difficult to deal with it alone, I will help you as soon as you ask me to," the man said in a gentle and confidential manner. At that moment Mark felt that he could handle any gossip and he perked up. The journey to school passed quickly for the boy. From the car window he explored his new surroundings. He hadn't been to this neighborhood before and everything here was new to him stores he had never heard of, dogs he had never seen, a new park and a new playground. Mark felt like even skipping school to look around. After a while, he already spotted the familiar building of his new school. As Dylan parked, Mark saw the girls from the parallel class watching the car. They were whispering, looking through the car windows from afar. And the moment Mark got out of the car, they were walking quickly to school. Inside the boy everything clenched. The fear of his peers of their mockery did not leave him, but Dylan was there for him. When the boy went up to the office, several classmates were already there. Oh, it was you who came in the car with our school psychologist, asked his deskmate Alan. Mark nodded his head and froze in the aisle. His heart began to beat faster, and his hands became clammy with nervousness. Would his new friends not be able to understand? He moved away from the aisle and walked slowly with a nervous shake of his head to his seat. Alan and the rest of his classmates were silent, staring at the newcomer with a mixed expression of curiosity and bewilderment on their faces. Suddenly one of them whispered, Why did you come together? The boy sighed and said quietly, Me and my mom. We live at his house. The classmates looked at the boy in surprise. Then Alan said, Dylan is a very nice person, so you don't have to worry. He is good to all of us, and he will be kind to you too. Hearing the words of encouragement, Mark almost cried. He expected everything from the students of his class, jokes, mockery, teasing, and even just contemptuous looks, but what he didn't expect was support and understanding. At the big break during lunch, every now and then the boys came up to Mark and asked about how the boy's mother and their school psychologist met. After a while the classmates, and then the students from the neighboring tables, began to answer the questions instead of Mark. They were chatting passionately and yet angrily among themselves. It seemed that this event was very joyful and pleasant for them. After class, Mark went to Dylan's office to tell if he was excused, but the man was not in his seat. The boy went out to the parking lot to see if the car that had brought a beer had left. Suddenly he saw Dylan already standing at the exit of the school, talking to Mark's mom. The boy was very surprised to see her here, but he was glad at the same time. His mom started to take Mark out of school more often and to spend more time with him, just as he had wanted to do. As it turned out, Angs had been invited to work at the school as a cook, 
when they found out that her son was studying here too, and a friend was working as a psychologist. It was on Dylan's advice that the principal called the woman and offered her the position. The salary at this place was higher than at the store. There were fewer responsibilities and the commute was much easier. Ains had always been an excellent cook. Her talents were noticed not only in the family, but in the whole neighborhood. Friends and acquaintances have always admired her ability to cook delicious and unusual dishes. But now she got the opportunity to reveal herself to the fullest. At a job interview, the headmistress suggested that she create her own menu for the school cafe. Ains not only agreed to the proposal, but also enthusiastically started to work. In just a few minutes, she had developed dishes that took the children's diet into account, to offer not only tasty but also healthy food for every child. At the end of the interview, the school principal not only signed a work contract with Agnes, but also included some of the proposed dishes in the school canteen menu. So from the next day Agnes had to come to work for the first lesson, prepare meals for the pupils and their teachers, and then she could be free if she wished. Mark was terribly happy about this news. Now they could all three of them would be able to drive in the mornings and come home at the same time too. But then his mom told the boy that they would ride the bus together today. So he would know how to get from school to home if he needed to. Mark nodded affirmatively, agreeing with his mom that adults can get sick and skipping school was not an option. So they headed toward the bus stop. They walked for a short time, but at a slow pace. That's why Mark had time to share with his mom his thoughts about the children's mockery yesterday and the fact that everything had not happened as he had expected. No one laughed at him. On the contrary, the boys were supportive and even interested in the situation. Ang sighed. She tried to explain to her son that everything that happened in his past school was not his fault. The real culprits of that despicable low behavior were his teachers, who showed no concern for the children who came to them. Moreover, they themselves, by their own bad example, incited the children to have a negative attitude towards the world and towards people. Moreover, they did not even know them personally. The woman tried to convey her message that her son should not blame himself for the past events. She emphasized that these were teachers who were unwilling to take responsibility for their own actions and certainly not able to take responsibility for others. Those teachers who independently showed children that the world could be viewed through the lens of prejudice and created negative attitudes about people in advance without knowing them personally. She had a real patient attitude, but her inner world was raging with emotion. Like a real mother, she told her son that every person deserves to be judged by his character, not by his origin or even more so by his appearance. Although it was difficult for him to accept this truth at such a young age, she hoped that these words would stay in his mind forever. Anne's realized that her son would need time to process everything she had said. She could only hope that her fame would put an end to the boy's past hurts. After all, only time would tell how these words would affect his future fate and attitude towards the world. As they rode home on the bus, each was thinking about something different. The boy sitting at the window was paying attention to the people passing by and thinking about the unchangeable necessity of fair treatment of every person. He thought that when he grew up, he would create a world around him where all people would be equal and would get what they really deserved. His mom, on the other hand, closed her eyes for a while, absorbed in her own thoughts. She reflected on the fact that the past cannot be changed, that every step, every decision irreversibly becomes a part of who we are now at this moment. However, with the experience of loss and disappointment, she realized that even without being able to change the past, it is always within her power to influence the present, and that a person's present is influenced not only by negative experiences, but also by positive ones. Every smile, every hug, conversation, family dinner, all of these things make a person human. The bus was approaching home. Mark and Angs awoke from their ruminations when the conductor announced their stop. They smiled at each other, realizing that they had both been thinking about something important and necessary for a long time. But these thoughts were so private that nobody discussed them. Everyone should have their own little secrets and secrets. Months passed, time like a wizard transformed Mark's childhood into an adult reality. Fifth grade was a new stage of his education, opening up new knowledge, desires and acquaintances for the boy. Angs took the position of school chef, preparing her culinary masterpieces to delight little children's hearts and bellies. Her skill delighted and inspired. Each dish became a true work of art, made with unfailing love and care for the children. Dylan decided to take on a young psychology intern to help him. He believed in the potential of each child, 
realizing that the role of educator and mentor requires not only knowledge and experience, but also an understanding of each child's state of mind. This psychologist in turn was a fresh wind of change, a person who could pick up on the subtle nuances of emotions and understand where their root was. They embodied their faith in the children, helping them to reach their potential and overcome challenges. Their understanding and support became important factors in each child's development. And the wisdom and attention of the psychologist helped to find the key to solving problems and discovering the individuality of each young patient. One winter day, when all the children were already released for New Year's vacation, Mark said that he would go home on his own, but first he would take a little walk. Ains and Dylan did not argue with the boy when they saw a classmate waiting for him on the porch. The weather at the end of December was frosty, but Mark was not afraid, and the cold did not stop him from enjoying the beautiful winter atmosphere. He walked along the streets covered with deep snow and listened to the sounds of snowflakes squeaking under his feet, feeling them dissolve on the hot soles of his boots. They were chatting with a friend about plans for the vacations and even agreed to meet in a week to go ice skating together at the stadium in the center of town. A beautifully decorated Christmas tree appeared in the distance, attracting the eye. Mark decided to walk up to it and admire its festive beauty. Peacefully crackled lights on the tree, creating a warm and cozy mood. The children stopped near the tree and looked at the decorations, Christmas toys and cards with wishes hanging on the tree for a long time. Suddenly Millie, Mark's friend, said she was cold and had to go home. The boy offered the girl to come into the warmth and drink hot cocoa to warm her up, but she refused. The guy, like a real gentleman, escorted his friend to the entrance and himself went to the bus stop. When he got home, he heard some commotion in the kitchen and called his mom. She looked out into the hallway and said that she and Dylan had a surprise, but while she was saying that, a little puppy came running out of the kitchen into the hallway and barked and ran toward Mark. The boy froze with his mouth open in shock and joy. Have you wanted a dog for a long time? said Dylan. And now you have a couple weeks to spend more time training this little guy, said Mom. Tears came to Mark's eyes. He rushed over to the puppy's side to hug him. The little shaggy puppy was overjoyed at the attention of his new friend and began licking his cheeks in joy and stomping his paws on the floor, trying to release his sudden energy. Mark's heart filled with unbelievable joy. Looking at his new pet, admiring his bright eyes and fluffy tail, he could not hold back his delight. The cherished dream of a faithful friend to share joys and sorrows with was finally realized, and he realized that now his life would never be the same. The new pet became an integral part of Mark's life. Every new day was filled with play and laughter. When the boy and his puppy ran around the yard park neighboring streets and explored the world together, the little tail always wagged very quickly with joy when his young master touched his soft head. He became the most loyal and faithful companion always ready to lend a helping paw or just lie down next to him to comfort and soothe the boy with his presence. The puppy, which everyone in the family called Lucky, not only brought laughter and delight, but also taught the boy responsibility and care for others. He taught him to be patient and caring and also helped him learn good deeds and proper communication with others. All this time, Mark thought about the fact that at his first class after winter break, he would call the whole class over to his house to introduce them to his new friend. He was sure that his classmates and his schoolmates would be able to share the joy of raising a dog with him and would be sure to help Mark in this responsible endeavor. His mother even promised Mark that she would bake delicious homemade cookies and boil cocoa for him. In the meantime, Mark needed to wash his friend's paws after a long, brisk walk. Do you know that the name Selena is supposed to remind you of the clinking of champagne glasses? You don't? Then listen to the way this name sounds and imagine. A holiday, New Year's Eve, icy champagne and bubbles that tingle your tongue and throat. It's also a name that sounds so affectionate. Anyway, that was her name. Even though she lived in a place where champagne wasn't in vogue, in a village at the end of the world, that's because she had a mom with a wacky mom. Well, you have to start with the grandmother. When her grandmother, a street Petersburg artist, after serving her time in the camps, was exiled here for eternal settlement, and after what she went through in Alaska, behind barbed wire, life in a village on the Volga seemed to her like a paradise. Friends sent money and she bought a house, a wooden house with blue shutters. Grandmother worked in the house of culture. She painted scenery and posters, washed the floors and stoked the stoves. Then Selena's mother came here to sew costumes for the dance group and choir, for the drama club and variety group. 
all the women in their family had golden hands, and all committed a misalliance. Grandmother was afraid to return to her hometown. It seemed to her that she would immediately be sent away again, and she got used to it, adapted to rural life. She married a forester, and then her daughter, my mother married a farmer, the richest man in the village. He raised cattle, sold milk and cheese, and he was good-looking witty, and he didn't stop her mother, Ariana, from doing what she loved, and she loved to sue. At first she intercepted with a keen eye. The local craftswoman shared their secrets, then she got to something on her own. And when she was taken as a costume designer in the House of Culture, it was pure bliss. No task frightened her. She sewed costumes for the fairy tale Cinderella and sundresses for folk dances and motley skirts for gypsy dances. Her whole life was in these scraps, threads, needles, in the clatter of the sewing machine and fitting. She created outfits like some kind of miracle, sometimes almost out of nothing. And if Selena could remember the earliest childhood, when she was not yet walking and talking, she would remember the costume room, countless rows of hangers, and her mother humming at the sewing machine. But the girl began to realize herself since she went to kindergarten, and here there was nothing special, the smell of burning milk in the morning, Semolina porridge, which all the kids hated, a playroom carpeted with carpet and dressed up dolls in the locker. The teachers did not always allow to take them, only for good behavior. Otherwise, here you have balls, pyramids, and stacked soft toys. In the kindergarten, Selena got a friend, Katie. She joined the group later than the others. Her family had moved to the countryside, and Katie was brought to the day care center in the middle of the year. She was special. Selena felt it immediately. Katie was the best at reciting poems and singing songs, and she was not afraid of the teachers if they were angry and raised their voices. Katie invented new games and was never bored with her. All the kids wanted to be friends with her, and she singled out Selena. I don't know why. Selena just followed her around like everyone else, her mouth hanging open and marveling at her jokes, her dresses and ribbons, her pranks. But somehow, Katie decided that Selena was her second self, and from then on they were seen together everywhere. Kathy taught Selena how to draw horses. Katie said she was going to be a famous horsewoman or a great actress. She made up games or told stories, all so mesmerizing to Selena that she immediately recognized her friend's superiority, and that the boys looked up to Katie was no surprise. Selena's mom, Ariana, was also interested in the acquaintance. Katie's father was a construction manager. New houses were built in the village, two and three stories. Then there was a whole complex, a calf downstairs and a department store upstairs. The building of the polyclinic was built new, replacing a small barrack and a lot of other things. And Katie's mom didn't work. She's my house fairy, the girl told her friends in all seriousness. Mom says, in the house all the time must live someone to be cozy and warm. And she's my house fairy. Selena didn't quite believe it Katie's mom didn't have wings, but the girl was fascinated by what was at her friend's house and what she didn't have. Fragile figurines, a ballerina frozen in a pirouette, the mistress of Copper Mountain with a lizard in her arms, the swan princess, the one with the star burning in her forehead all lived high on the shelves. But Katie's mom took one of the fairy tale characters down every day for the girls to play with and she had rings on her fingers and the stones sparkled so beautifully. And Jenny's mom baked a Napoleon cake, a luxury Selena hadn't tasted at home. And the girls went to school together too. The school is far away at the entrance to the district center. Most kids can't get here in the fall slush and winter ice. That's why a yellow bus with the inscription children on the side took them in the mornings. And after classes, it took them back to their homes. These first school years, Bouquets of asters of all colors of the rainbow, new dressy uniforms, corridors, huge, on which you want to run so much, but you can't. They catch you by the hand, and they write down the names, and then they hang a leaflet, where a lightning bolt is drawn and all the violators of discipline are listed. Selena was shy by nature. She never wanted to draw attention to herself. She was the kind of girl they say is quieter than water, lower than grass, and the teacher's remarks have set her almost to tears. Katie was always thinking of something and got into various messes. She would go ice skating with the boys when the ice on the lake was still thin, and luckily she would fall through only knee deep. 
Then on a dare, he will pet the big sheepdog, which is feared by all the boys, and which from time to time comes off the chain. He will invent a secret language, consisting of words and gestures, which all the boys will immediately master and begin to explain themselves in it, throwing the teachers into anger and panic. But it was Selena, not her perky friend, who got into real trouble. Selena was stolen. This case was remembered for a long time, because it was the first time such a story had happened, and nothing like it had ever happened again. Selena was 10 years old at the time. She was returning on the school bus with everyone else, but she got off one stop earlier to go to the store to buy new notebooks. The store was in the center of the village, and it took about 20 minutes to walk from here to home. Selena chose notebooks with beautiful pictures on the covers, paid, then she was hurried by the ladies in line. In short, she didn't notice that she had left a bag with a sports uniform and a change of shoes near the counter, so she walked with the backpack behind her back. She was already approaching her house when a car pulled up next to her and an unfamiliar man called out, Hey girl, isn't this yours? In his hand, he held a familiar green bag. Selena gasped. She would have gotten in trouble at home, of course. Taking it, the uncle opened the door she trustingly approached. Who could have known that she would be dragged into the car at the same moment so that she wouldn't have time to make a sound? They searched for Selena for a week. Notices were posted on every fence and every pole. Volunteers combed the forest, searched even in the lake and in the river. And after a week, no one, neither the police nor her volunteer helpers, hopes to find the girl alive. There was no hope left. Fortunately, Selena's kidnapper was no maniac. All he wanted was to make some easy money. That's why he waited until everyone was sufficiently scared and would be willing to pay any amount to get the girl back. It seemed to him that he planned everything clearly and correctly and asked for as much as half a million. With this money, the kidnapper expected to go far away and start his own business. But once he called Selena's parents and told them his demands, his fate was sealed. Maybe if he'd been more experienced and organized things differently, things would have worked out. But as it was, so it was. Selena's mom could not talk to the kidnapper. The woman was lying in bed. She was sedated. Her father was told by the police to arrange a meeting. The appointment was at the gate of an abandoned factory. Harry took with him a bag of money, stood holding it in front of him. As soon as the kidnapper arrived, he was immediately taken. It turned out that the villain lived in a neighboring village. He did not know Pavel personally, only heard about him as a wealthy man. The kidnapper was also offended by the fact that he was detained, questioned, and threatened with trial. The girl lived with me like my own daughter. I fed her, gave her food, showed her cartoons on TV. I didn't let her outside, though. And it's true, Selena, though she cried these days, because she was separated from her parents, but otherwise did not suffer in any way. The doctor examined her and said that the girl would obviously forget everything soon. Selena's abduction cost her parents a lot more. The father blamed the mother. Kathy's mother is doing the housework, and I told you to stay home. There's always enough work to do. We have a car. You could have studied, passed your driver's license, taken your daughter to school, and picked her up. But you're like the last girl. You collect your rags and run to the house of culture with them. Alinka is abandoned on her own. Ariana not only felt deeply guilty, she kind of lost it after the whole thing. Now several times a day she would stand motionless, staring straight ahead, her lips moving soundlessly. It was useless to touch her at such times. It went on like that for months and then Harry left the family. He had a young girlfriend, it turned out. Maybe it would have ended in divorce. But the drama escalated and eventually became a reason to sever old ties. Harry sold the farm and moved away with his young wife. I know my strength now, he said. I'll make a new start. Lucy and I will move south. I'll get land again. Buy cow. The winter is not so long there. The climate is favorable. Things will pick up. But before he left, my father insisted that Selena be sent to a boarding school. There was one in the district center especially for children from remote villages. Here parents didn't have to worry about them. Caretakers were always watching the children. The building is huge. Here are classrooms here, in another wing, bedrooms and dining room. The children walked under supervision in the schoolyard and no stranger would enter the boarding school without asking. There was a guard at the entrance. 
Everyone in the neighborhood knew Selena's story, so there were no obstacles to registering her at the boarding school. Harry also talked to the director, adding that the girl's mother was sick in the head. So I ask you very much, let the daughter be with you even on vacation. I will try to carve out time to come at least a couple times a year to visit her, he said. Harry made a favorable impression on the principal. She promised to honor his request to keep mother-daughter contact to a minimum. Selena was a homely girl, and for the first time at boarding school, she was homesick. She also had a harder time than the others. The bedroom was big for eight girls. Selena got the worst bed by the door. The walls, painted with green oil paint, dross, and almost always after bedtime, Selena covered herself with a thin blanket, which did not save her from the cold and cried quietly so as not to wake the girls. Almost all of her classmates were taken home for the weekend by their parents. Selena stayed at the boarding school in the company of several children. Something was constantly breaking down in the boiler room, and the boys were freezing. The principal only sighed when she was told that it was 15 degrees in the bedrooms. Let the children take second blankets. What else can I do? The boiler's dying. The girls brought blankets from home, some of them cotton, some down. They brought warm sweaters and jackets. Selena's mother was told to be wrapped up at the entrance. It happened here too. From time to time, children of parents who drank or were scandalous or both were brought to the boarding school. It happened that someone attacked the teachers with profanity or even raised a hand. Selena's mother was in the same category. It was easier to keep her out. Bring 200 grams of candy Karalka in the transfer and nothing else is not necessary. We will not accept, they told her, the children have everything, they are all provided here. We don't take tangerines and oranges, or your daughter will take the fruit and give it to someone, and we have children with allergies. Selena's mother didn't work at the cultural center anymore. She couldn't concentrate on patterns and fabrics, needles and scissors. Everything was falling out of her hands, but she had to earn a living, so she went to work for the very man Harry had sold the farm to. He'd worked hard in his time and had raised a fine herd of pedigree goats, and Ariana took to caring for the animals without a word. She fed and fed, cleaned up manure, milked, and if necessary, she helped the owner to treat the wards. In a short time, the woman changed. If before she was pretty, cheerful, coquettish, now it was difficult to recognize her. Her hands, previously delicate and manicured, were now calloused. There was no place on the farm for the nice, smart clothes Ariana loved so much. An old jacket, rubber boots, old pants. All this woman now did not take off. She forgotten her makeup too. And the smell of the stable was more persistent than any perfume, even ten times washed at home. Not being strong by nature, Ariana was so tired that in the evening she only had the strength to drink tea with a piece of bread and fall asleep and yet she did not feel unhappy. Let the family broke up, but the daughter was alive. That's the main thing. And the mother held out hope that sooner or later they would be together again. Besides, Ariana had grown attached to the animals and socializing with them helped her to heal. The goats and goat kids, each with their own personalities, stubborn and funny, surrounded her from morning to night and caring for them in some way healed her wounded motherhood. Jacob, the owner, was not a bad man, and the main thing was that he was reasonable. If an animal got sick, he called a veterinarian, and then calculated whether it would cost a lot to treat it, and what would be more profitable, to try to put the goat on its feet or to put it away in the freezer. So he acted accordingly. Ariana tried to nurse every goat, even the weakest one, to give it a chance. She didn't think about the future yet, she only hoped that Selena would safely graduate from school and return to her. The attitude of the teachers at the boarding school to Selena's mother changed only when the girl began to study in high school. During all this time, the father, who vaunted how he loved his daughter, never once visited her. There were a lot of reasons, and went far away, and things in a new place was a lot, and new children were born. And if the first time he still called his daughter to congratulate her on her birthday, then later in this formal communication came to naught, and the mother came every weekend. When she was denied a date on one pretext or another, she and Selena communicated through the window. That's where Jenkins' secret sign language came in handy, and on summer vacations, there was nowhere to go. Selena was allowed to go home. After all, Ariana was not registered with a psychiatrist, and although the woman has changed a lot in appearance, 
health to her little by little returned. Time and constant communication with animals turned out to be the best doctors. The three summer months seemed to Selena a period of carefree happiness. Living in her own home, helping her mother on the farm, and Katie made sure that the vacations were filled with adventures, like a generous Santa sack of presents. And every time Selena thought that her friend had thought of something quite unbelievable, but Kathy convinced her that everything was possible and it would be great. You would think of some quieter entertainment, said Katie's mom, as they say now, girly. Well, go to town, go to the movies, wander around the mall, have a coffee. I can understand that. You mean we have to go to town every day? Katie asked. It's a long summer. It's crazy. What do the other kids do? Everybody finds something to do without going to extremes. Yeah, Katie said ironically. The boys ride mopeds around the streets at night, just dodging them. And the girls have only this beach, a trampled spot. The circus comes to the House of Culture twice a summer. And that's it. That's it. That's it. Only to hang out in their own backyards, right? Look how Sasha sings. Vox on Naya Street, the most central street. Girls on a bench, chewing on seeds. Mom waved her hand and stepped back, repeating the usual shorthand. Don't go into the woods where there are hunting grounds. Watch your feet carefully. We have plenty of vipers here. Don't swim in unfamiliar places. There are pools on the river. As soon as it gets dark, go home. Katie nodded, pretending to agree with everything, and rushed to her friend, her heels glistening. This time, too, Selena had no time to marvel at how good it was at home, how the lilac bush had grown under her window, how strong the old dog's memory was, how happy he was to see her. She had no sooner laid out her things than Kathy was already here. I have a plan, she said solemnly. I'm sure you do, Selena sighed. Don't get your hopes up. I want to help my mom. She's so tired in the evenings. She's been exhausted for a year. She'll feel a little better with me. Three days. Katie pointed her fingers, just three days, and then I'll help your mom too. I'll even weed the damn beds, which I hate. So what have you come up with this time? Ah, uh, no, wait, you can't just tell it like that. It has to be detailed. I'm staying at your place tonight, then we'll talk. The ram of the day's business began. It was hot, unbelievable even for June, and the air itself seemed to melt. But Katie, who was so hard to entice to the vegetable garden at home, Together with her friend carried watering cans, watered vegetables, and weeded strawberries. The girls were free only in the evening. They asked to go to the river. Though it was a long way to go, but it was worth it. The meadows were in bloom and Selena, who was imprisoned in the walls of the boarding school all year, was seized by the delight of an unprecedented sense of freedom. She wanted to spin, throwing her head back, under this vast blue sky, and that together with her spinning and puffy as cotton candy clouds, and these flowers, the intoxicating smell of honey in the river, which was visible in the distance. The girls ignored the small beach, where mostly all the locals went, but it was worth crossing the ravine, without fear of nettles, crossing a dilapidated bridge, and deep into the forest, as you could come to a wonderful place. Right in the middle of the river was an island. The river was fast, but shallow. You could wade across. And here, on the island, no one from all sides, you can swim, sunbathe, talk about your secrets at the top of your voice. No one but the birds can hear. When the girls had had enough of swimming in the clear, cool water, felt revived again and laid down on the sand, Katie paused mysteriously and said, My father bought me an inflatable boat. How did you talk him into it? Selena wondered, I know you wanted it, but mom told you not to ask for it. I swore that you and I would only swim in the lake. The lake was quite large, curving around the village. It was beautiful, but my friends didn't like it much. Marshy shores, swimming only from bridges, and a wall of forest on one side. Probably, Katie's father assumed that there were always enough fishermen on the lake, and her daughter would not be in trouble here, and if there was trouble, people would help her. But, Katie raised her finger. What if you and I go on the river on such a trip? As our historian Valandra says on the native land. For three days, as far as Rosdisvinsk go, huh? There, downstream, my boat, and back, if we want, we can either the same way or hitchhike home. The big old village, which was relatively close by, was filled with tourists and vacationers in summer. 
The trip itself was tempting, but Katie hadn't yet revealed all the cards. I know that there, except for the agricultural technical school and the ruins of the factory and the sites that seem to be no, everybody goes there, mainly for the beautiful nature. And we, you and I will go to the Baron's house. What house? Selena didn't think she heard. That was the card Katie had up her sleeve. She was talking in a hurry, emotion overflowing. It turned out that once a nobleman from Street Petersburg, the brother of the Empress's favorite, by the way, had acquired an estate here. There was a lot of things here. There was a lord's house, and the manager's outbuilding and stables, and even a small church, and so on and so forth. Almost none of it has survived, except for the bar house, which was obviously built for centuries. The owner himself lived here very little. He stayed more and more in New York and abroad. Maybe he had originally planned to come here for the summer, but only then he forgot about this place. Until he decided to get rid of his wife. It is said that he dreamed of hairs and married a girl who was not rich, but very beautiful, and who was two or even three times younger than him. But with hairs did not work out. The only son died in infancy. Then the Count made a new girlfriend, and since divorces at that time, to put it mildly, were not very good, he sent his wife here, out of sight. Like, I'll support you, but you must never appear in my house again. This beautiful woman lived here until her death and died here. And young, she wasn't even 30 years old yet. She was said to have lost her mind in her last years. Yes, there was also a family crypt on the estate. And the unhappy woman made one condition. She would leave and would not remind her husband of herself. Only let her boy's body be reburied in the crypt so she could visit his grave. There's nothing else left for her in this life. And then, whether with the head of the barmaid became disordered, or whether she sincerely believed in different sorcerers, but as if she hoped with their help to revive her son, or just with his soul to communicate. It's like at spiritualistic seances different spirits are summoned. Of course, there are no reliable descriptions, maybe they are just legends. It's also unknown whether she succeeded or not. The end of Countess Catherine herself was as mysterious as her life. The year of her death in the few documents indicated differently. Presumably she left at the age of between 28 and 30 years. When the manor house was finally abandoned, some of the locals decided to rob the house, and at the same time the crypt, the grave of the countess was not there. Today, the surviving house is in complete disrepair, becoming a shelter for various marginalized people. That's why it is not mentioned in any tourist guides, and guides do not take tours there. It's a miracle the mansion is still standing. If the walls weren't so strong, everything would have fallen apart long ago. It's got two floors and a mezzanine, Katie continued. The guys from our school wandered in by accident. They say a few people live there. The windows are covered with rags or plastic sheeting, and the beds are rags. But some remnants of former luxury have survived. Some tiles, some stove flaps. The bums are there all year round. Only one night a year they try not to stay in the house. It's the anniversary of the death of the Countess's little son. They say Catherine's ghost appears there at midnight. A lady dressed in white walks through the empty house. Then she goes up to the mezzanine, where these seances were held, and there she disappears, as if she were going into a large mirror. And that's the night that's gonna happen next week. Let's go catch a ghost, huh? Selena blinked a lot. Why do you need it? That was the first thing she asked. Look. It's probably in every old house, the lady in white, the gentleman in black. People can't do without scary stories. There's no one there, I'm sure. Just bombshells. Well, even if you see him, how are you going to catch him, this ghost? And what are you going to do with it? It's not a genie. You can't put it in a lamp and make it come out and do what you want. But Selena knew her friend too well. If the word interesting lit up in front of Katie with a neon flame, there were no obstacles for her. She forgot everything. She was driven by passion, like Rocky the mouse who saw the cheese in front of him. I don't know. Maybe there's some treasure left there, and the ghost will show it to us, or tell us some terrible secret. It doesn't matter. Just think how great it would be if we could see it. It's otherworldly. Her friend's voice sounded ecstatic. Selena sighed again. There's no use in talking you out of it, I take it. Absolutely. Katie confirmed easily, but you're with me, aren't you? I'm not going to catch a ghost, 
and I'm not going to make friends with the marginalized. You can go and catch your ghost. I'll wait for you somewhere, not far away. The rest of the evening, the girlfriends were going to spend discussing the details of the trip. They were used to the fact that the island was the most secluded place and belonged only to the two of them. That's why they were both so surprised to see a young man on the shore on the cliff. The boy was older than them. If the girlfriends were 15 years old, he was about 18 or even 20, a respectable age, and he was glad to see them. Girls, I'm lost here. Can you tell me how to get to the village? We're not from around here, Katie mumbled to her friend, and she answered loudly, we'll show you, of course. I just wonder how you got lost here. Wait, don't come down to us. Look around. There should be a path behind you. You'll follow it to the concrete road. Well, it's a road paved with slabs, and along it there will be dry trees on the left, and then on the right there's a long hill. If you watched Teletubbies as a kid, it looks like their house. When you pass the hill, you'll see the roofs in the distance, and the water tower. I'll go down after all. The heat is unbelievable. Is it so shallow everywhere here, or is there a place where you can take a dip? There's a pool farther away, Talena told me. She herself, although she had learned to swim, preferred shallow water. The cliff was really steep, the tree that grew on its edge had long roots, and like an uncombed mane of hair went down to the shore, and clinging to them, intercepting them with his hands, the boy found himself on the shore. Here? He asked, pointing to where the river had overflowed. Here, Kathy confirmed. The boy threw off his clothes and plunged into the cool river with visible pleasure. He swam on his side and on his back, died. He's showing off in front of us, Katie whispered to Selena. Finally, the boy surfaced near their islet and was sitting next to his girlfriends, large drops of water glistening on his back. He told them that he had come to the neighboring village, to his aunt's house. There were many lakes in the neighborhood, and he was advised to go to one of them, the one in the middle of nowhere. They say that the river used to flow in a different channel, but then it made a small dam on it, and the channel changed. And where it was before, this very lake remains. My name's John, by the way. The nature was really magnificent, and John regretted that he had not brought his camera, but he managed to get lost and barely escaped from the vipers. Snakes obviously considered themselves the mistresses of those eats. And there were two no-hunting posters. I didn't want to unexpectedly encounter those that were forbidden to hunt, especially if they were large and predatory. John sounded like he was making fun of himself. And then when I finally got out of the thicket, there were fields, and no direction to go, just a sea of green all around, and no one to ask. So you guys really helped me out. He even clasped his hand to his chest. Please, answered Katie in the same mocking tone. We provide services, replace the compass, tell the way. We came on acquaintance and in a pool to drown. How are you going to get back? Selena asked worriedly. You'll have to go to the bus stop. At seven o'clock, the last bus will go. You'll get to your village. For some reason, though John was good looking, she felt uncomfortable and a little afraid in his presence. Katie didn't seem to think anything bad, and back to the village they went together. It turned out that Selena was walking a little away from her friend and John, and they, engrossed in conversation, did not notice it. It turned out that John is already a student studying at the law school. They have a whole dynasty, starting with his grandfather, an old lawyer. This year they were going to go to the sea, but his father was busy at work, he was assigned a case, which he could not give up. As a consolation to this family, he promised to postpone the vacation to the New Year vacations and together go somewhere in a foreign resort. John thought that he would have to spend the summer in the city, but he loves traveling so much. Visit Aunt Elizabeth, his mother suggested. She'd be pleased. There's fresh air, woods, and a river, all that variety. In a couple of days, John had explored the village thoroughly and was bored. Using satellite maps, he began to find out what else was interesting in the area. These places were famous for lakes, large and small, and swamps. As for sites, there were not many of them in the vicinity. Unless, the remains of an ancient settlement. But first of all, archaeologists there, most likely, have already chosen all interesting finds. In the second place, you need to have special knowledge to evaluate what you have found. It's one thing to dig up a treasure, it's clear to everyone, gold and diamonds. 
and quite another to shed tears of adoration over some clay pottery, just because it belongs to an ancient culture. So John just did not know where else to go. The trip to his aunt in the village did not give him any surprises. I don't know about that, Katie said. And though she wasn't going to share her plans with anyone but her friend, she couldn't resist. She told her that next week, she and Selena were going to solve one of the local mysteries. Will you take me with you? John was excited. You won't fit third in the boat, but we can arrange to meet at the house. The adventure seemed to be even more charming in Katie's eyes when it became clear that they would have such a companion. Selena, on the other hand, felt like giving up on the trip. For the first time, she saw that her friend had completely forgotten about her, not even looking back. The girl began to look for a reason to separate from the company, and at the same time to abandon the trip. You can say that mom will be worried, and when they returned to the village, Katie decided to escort her new friend to the bus stop. Selena, on the other hand, referred to the fact that she was home for the first day, not even having her things all laid out yet, and said goodbye. But Katie still came running to her place for a sleepover. And the friends, as always, lingered in the garden, under the starry sky, and then whispered for a long time in the small room, which in summer became a bedroom. Over the course of a year, they both accumulated a huge amount of news. Katie said the program was getting harder and harder, and her mother was terribly upset when her daughter brought home C's. I don't know what I'm going to do, Katie said. Our class is like the movie Dumb and Dumber. We don't even have anyone to copy from. My mom is threatening to hire me a tutor, algebra, geometry, physics. But, you know, I can't get it all in my head. Physics, in my opinion, was invented specifically to make fun of people. Now my mom will pay money and I, instead of living my life, will sit with our Anna and who else my mom can hire as not our same physicist, not. Pretend that I understand something. And on the test again, no clue. Still, you are happy. Selena lay on her stomach and seemed to be looking at the pattern on the pillow, running her finger over it. Every day after school, you come home. It's like I have two lives. At home, one. And when I come to the boarding school in the fall, the other begins. And Selena, not complaining, but just so that her friend could imagine, began to tell about how she had to eat food in the canteen, which she did not like, semolina and pea soup, to eat just not to stay hungry. The kids get bread from the canteen. The older ones get something from their relatives for pocket money. They run to the store to buy buns, something sweet. I try not to ask my mom for money, it's hard for her. I say that we have everything at the boarding school. If I take it, it's only a little for new tice for shampoo. But in general, we can't have anything particularly good, they'll steal it. The drawers are not locked. You can't complain to the teachers, I've learned that from childhood. Everyone despises a bully, and boys are best not to be messed with. They stole a new girl's cell phone. She's 12 years old, she's still young. Cell phone thing expensive, she cried, then still went and the teacher and told her. Of course, there was a commotion. They made a real search in the bedrooms and found the cell phone under the boys' mattresses, and how can you punish them when even many teachers are afraid of them? Those boys in high school, they just pretend it's okay. They found the phone, problem solved. But then the boys hounded that poor girl. They ran up to her at recess, pulled up her skirt, and shouted at the whole corridor what color her panties are. Teachers tried to do something, scolded them, gave them a D for behavior, threatened to expel them. They could not do anything. As a result, this girl was taken away by her mother and homeschooled. Listen, why doesn't your mom take you? Katie suddenly asked. Me? Selena was confused. My father told me to finish school there at the boarding school. Kathy whistled. Where is he, that father? I don't think he cares where you are or what's wrong with you. Mom's not disenfranchised. Let her go and file a report and we'll be back in the same class. Selena had a flicker of hope, but she was afraid to give it away. You know what my mom's like. She's so quiet, unresponsive. She can't raise her voice at anyone, can't fight. The principal will say to her, let the girl finish her studies with us and she won't dare object. You know how I cursed that uncle who stole me. Not for me, he didn't actually do anything to me. All I remember is that I was sitting there watching, well, wait on TV. I'm for my mom, you may not remember, but I do. She used to be a completely different person. My dad used to say about her that she was a holiday woman. Well, we'll talk more about it. 
Kitty said thoughtfully, apparently still thinking about it. They fell asleep when the sky in the east began to lighten up. The days left before the journey began flew by like an arrow. The girls managed to persuade their parents to let them go to Rostisvinsko and back. Selena's mom had the hardest time, but she was persuaded with a chorus. Well, you cannot deprive the girl completely independent, said Jenkins' father. In a few years she's so and so to leave here. She will enter a technical school or an institute. She will start her own life. If you patronize her like this, then she will have ten times more difficulty. I understand. Ariana agreed with a guilty look, but she was still slow to let go of her daughter's hand. You'd have to drown in our river. A chicken can wade through it. Our daughters can swim. Now they're practicing with the boat on the lake. And the girls really practiced. They swam to the farthest edge of the lake, where seldom anyone wandered. The forest was so dense here. They rubbed their palms with paddles and Selena, who was used to the sun, managed to get burned. Finally, the tent, sleeping bags, and everything else necessary for the trip were packed. We decided to set off in the morning. In the first place, it was not hot yet. And in the second place, the girlfriends expected to stop for an hour in the afternoon and still swim to Rostisvinsko in the evening. Jenya's mother wanted to call her acquaintance to let the girls spend the night. Her daughter barely managed to talk her out of it. Mom, that's the whole interest. A tent, night, fire, and night at Aunt Lita's in the hall on Kaz. Of course, the girls didn't mention the real purpose of their trip. Katie had been to the sea with her parents many times before, but when at dawn their boat left the shore and, obeying the oars and the current, rushed forward, the girl thought that she liked this trip much better. The fresh wind chilled her cheeks, and at every turn there was something unknown waiting for her, and no crowded beaches and crowds of vacationers. In the middle of the day, when the sun was already hot enough, the girls chose a place where the pine trees approached the shore. They took out sandwiches and a thermos of iced tea and stretched out blissfully in the shade. Do you think John will come? Katie asked. Who knows? Wouldn't it be better without him? Selena said cautiously. It's such a special feeling to have someone protecting you. I thought you weren't afraid of anything, Selena wondered, and you trust this guy that much. You've only seen him once. I have a knack for people, Katie said flatly, and there's no one to be friends with around here. I'm getting so sick of the neighbors going, Janisha, you've gotten so pretty. Do you have a boy? You'll finish school. You'll get married. Don't drag it out. Yeah, you should see our slackers. The boys in our class have already tormented the teachers. They don't need history, and English will never be useful in their lives. I can see that none of them will go to college. Have you thought about where you want to go? Selena asked. I'm going to go to the theater school, Kathy said it as a joke, but it's known that in every joke. You can do it. Selena was serious. I can't think of anything but going back to my mom. I'm afraid to go far away. What if something happens to her? She has no one but me, and I have no one but her. They reached the place when the sun was already low on the horizon. Selena thought it was necessary to choose a suitable place on the shore and put up the tent. Day X was coming tomorrow. They would have plenty of time in the morning to tour the bar's house and make arrangements to stay there overnight. Katie, on the other hand, thought they should go to the old mansion right now. What are we going to do for a couple more hours on the beach to feed the mosquitoes? We got the map, come on, we'll be there before dark. I want to see how this house looks at dusk, atmospheric. Go on, Selena agreed, I'll stay here. You can't leave your stuff behind anyway. And the boat, let's set up the tent and go. I'll get dinner started. Katie didn't want to admit to herself that it wasn't just her desire to see the old house in the sunset light that was driving her. She hadn't exchanged phone numbers with John, nor had they agreed on a specific place to meet but had limited themselves to a vague meet at the mansion. The chance of meeting a new acquaintance right here and now was slim, but Kathy pretended she wasn't going for that. The old baron's house stood a little away from the village. For a long time it had been occupied by an agricultural college, so there was no hope that any of the old things inside had survived, except for the things that couldn't be taken out, like the moldings on the ceiling and the mezzanine was rumored to have been used as a storage area for junk long ago. The house was a sad sight. Most of the windows were broken, the main entrance was boarded up, the stairs were scratched, and yet there was some life here. 
There, a figure flashed through the window. Voices were heard. Someone coughed softly behind Katie's back, and she turned around. A man of indeterminate age, with a puffy face and a purple tint, approached unnoticed. Apparently, he had a decent drinking record. Despite the fact that the heat was still on, he was wearing a warm jacket that smelled stale from a distance. Are you interested in old times? He asked. Sort of, Katie answered cautiously. On the one hand, she was afraid to talk to a stranger here, when people were far away. On the other hand, she and Selena would want to sneak into the house tomorrow, which meant she'd have to make contact with just such individuals. Almost no one comes here now, said the man before, when the technical school was here. The house still looked good. And now what? Just ruins. The roof is about to collapse. Have you been inside? I, I live there, said the new acquaintance with a touch of pride. When the technical school moved, of course, they wanted to tear everything apart. Well, it's like the houses are being dismantled. Somebody wanted frames, somebody wanted doors, somebody wanted floorboards. Well, I guess me and the kids didn't let them. The kids? Katie was confused. Well, there's a few of us around here. Aborigines, so to speak. It's all right, we've settled in. In winter, we warm ourselves with the stove. We can live. But if you want to see the house, you chose a bad time. Why? The girl asked cautiously. You can't see much now. It's getting dark. And tomorrow? He hesitated. Tomorrow what? It won't be a good day, the man decided. It's peaceful here. Except for this day. Sometimes it goes by unnoticed. Nothing happens. And sometimes, I can't find a word for it. A fog. An obsession. You can see something here. It's a strange story. I'll tell you if you want. Are you staying in the village? Shall I show you out? A lady has a chap room came a voice that Katie recognized immediately. And immediately the fear vanished. Now Katie was ready to go to the very attic where, according to rumors, the antique mirror had stood before, or even still stood. But she knew they wouldn't see anything now. If anything was going to happen, it would be tomorrow. They were shown into the attic by a familiar marginalized man. Before that he introduced himself with honor. His name was Victor, but the kids called him Bye-bye. Babai behaved so friendly as if he was the owner of the manor and they had come to visit him. Following him, the girls and John went up to the second floor and passed through a long corridor. Everyone looked around curiously. Here, where they passed, the traces of antiquity had almost disappeared. What remained was the interior of the era of the technical school to which the building had belonged for three decades. The corridor was once painted with blue paint. Some rooms had lost their doors and then the boys saw a stove in an empty room, the remains of a sofa or piles of junk. And then Babai opened an inconspicuous door at the end and said, Please. It was obvious that he was trying to impress the girls. There was another staircase that led upstairs, narrow with steep steps. Selena remembered climbing up to the church bell tower with the other kids to ring the bell on Easter when she was a child. There were similar steps on the bell tower, and the next day the girl's legs were very sore. Now there's no way I'll believe that the Countess had ever climbed up here in her lifetime, Katie grumbled. You'd have to try to climb that steepness in a long dress and a half. There was only one room in the attic, a very small one. Maybe no one had ever lived in it. But Selena imagined that the Countess had a study here. Here, by the window, was a mahogany desk covered with green cloth. And this lady wrote bitter letters to her unfaithful husband, from time to time stopping, biting the tip of the pen to gather her thoughts and looking out the window. The view from here was really wonderful. The house was nestled on a small hill. The forest, the river, and the village were all in sight. Is this the mirror you were talking about? John asked. How did he see it? In the corner of the room, littered with broken frames and some dilapidated furniture, stood a tall mirror, larger than a man, in a simple wooden frame. One might have been tempted to take it away, but the mirror's surface was dull, and it was difficult to see one's reflection even in the most general way. Exactly, Katie said, oh no. There just can't be any other here. It needs to be vacated. Is it realistic to move all this furniture? Hey, wait a minute, said Babai. This stuff wasn't just piled up here by accident. It used to hang on the wall, that mirror. But this one, maybe it's not just for a reason. What do you mean? Well, it's not just glass, it's like a passage. It's how she comes in and out. 
John sniffed behind Babai's back and then flicked himself on the neck, letting the girls know that the marginalized man had had his fill of the morning. It's okay, Katie said to Babai, we might just want to socialize. Babai was dumbfounded. With a ghost? Him. Their interlocutor just shook his head. Then he said he couldn't help the guys anymore, let them sort it out themselves and went to the door. Will you be staying in the house tonight? Katie called after him. I was called to the village, for an ear, that is, and a bath. Babai said it without turning around, but Katie thought he blushed, because he realized he was leaving the house for another reason. Left alone, the boys prepared to wait. They cleared a place in the corner and laid down the old blanket Katie had thoughtfully brought with her. Everyone was excited, so they didn't even think about food. But the bottle of lemonade was quickly emptied. It wasn't as hot here in the attic as it was outside. The walls of the house not only shielded them from the heat, they even felt damp. There was still time before the sun went down. At first, John entertained the girls with stories about traveling. He had traveled a lot of places, both with his parents and alone. At the same time, the guy did not boast about what he had seen, did not describe foreign purchases, and recalled more and more amusing cases, and did not hesitate to mention how he got into trouble but more often he shared what delighted or disappointed him. Then the conversation quietly turned to various abnormal things. And that's where John became more skeptical than the girls, but an unusual skeptic. It was felt that he himself very much wants to be sure of the existence of miracles. He is looking for it. But if you dig deeper, everything is rational explanations. Next to the city, on the other side of you, there's a national park. And there, in its deepest place, right in the center of the bow, a forest cordon. Well, it's clear, there are specialists there watching the animals, all that kind of stuff. The forester lives there all the time and the national park employees come and go. So there every summer those weirdos, who on various anomalies moved, straight pilgrimages arrange pilgrimages, and their clocks stop there and people lose the idea of time, and mosquitoes are especially angry. The mistress of these places put them to guard the road and not let anyone in. Some see green lights at night. Some see luminous pillars. Some go to one place and come out in another, especially if they have taken a good braceful before, like our babai. Katie couldn't take it anymore and giggled. Selena, how do you feel about it? John asked, seemingly just to draw the girl into the conversation. Selena shrugged. I believe in prophetic dreams. I've seen a couple times in my life myself. Nothing significant. There's not much to tell. It's just that first it was a dream, and then it happened in real life. It seems to me that those who died, they can only come in dreams, because we call them, miss them, and thus lure them. And the fact that we're waiting for the Countess now, we're baiting her soul. John laughed when Celine shook her head, you little girl. And he touched the tip of her nose with his finger. That's what you do to babies. And then you say, beep. The moon is coming up, said Katie. Let's sit quietly for a while, in case something happens. They stood still and waited. Now all three of them were getting a little uneasy. The room, which they had grown kind of used to in the hours they had spent here, now seemed not quite real to them, ghostly. The moonlight drew a path on the floor, which was occasionally crossed by the shadows of the branches outside the window, swaying in the breeze. They were silent, but the longer the time dragged on, the more it seemed to them that they had been silent for ages. And now the ghost would appear at the door. John said in a quiet, but deliberately scary voice. Selena wrapped her arms around herself. Even though she was sitting in the middle, between John and Katie, she didn't feel safe. Unless you closed your eyes and imagined it was all a dream. And in reality, you are in your room or, in the extreme case, in the boarding school bedroom. Katie, the most impatient of them all, had the hardest time. Maybe it's just an idea that this is where the ghost comes from. It's coming out of the attic. We're sitting here like fools, waiting, and he's wandering around the house, glimpsing here and there. Maybe he's searching the house. They'll think you're a ghost, John suggested. Your blouse is light colored. If any of the homeless people are still there, they'll scream, especially if you step on them. What if Selena started but didn't dare to continue? Of course, this thought was naive, and she shouldn't have shared it with her friends. Still, she couldn't resist checking it out. She got up, walked silently over to the mirror, 
which glowed faintly in the darkness, and brought her face close to it. She always liked to look at stereo pictures. You look through the patterns, then as if you were pulling your gaze into your own dimension, but slowly, slowly, and then suddenly a three-dimensional figure suddenly appeared. A swimming fish, a running man, something else. Selena looked through the mirror, into nowhere, into eternity, or maybe into the very essence of herself, and then tried to come back, and then it was as if it burst from inside, only for her, for Selena, visible, such bright, such big blue eyes, which seemed to belong to a man, looked straight at her, they looked, burned with their certainty, it could not seem it was a look from there, from the beyond, Selene shrieked, but it was a squeeze, and everything went black, she was lying on the grass, and Katie was gently touching her face with something cold and wet. Selena had never heard her friend's voice so frightened before. Nothing. Her own voice sounded so quiet that Selena thought no one would hear. Where are we? In the clearing by the house, Katie said hurriedly, John carried you out in his arms. You saw something, didn't you? Don't question her. The boy hastily intervened. Let her come to her senses first. Celine felt so weak that she wanted only to close her eyes and not move, but she knew that would frighten her friends even more, so after a few minutes she sat up. She had to put her hand on the ground though. Are we staying here? Katie looked at John. She won't be able to walk, will she? Wait, I'll be right back. I'll be back in a little bit and then we'll go, Selena promised. They made their way to the tent on the beach. Selena was leaning on John's arm and Katie was ready to pick her up on the other side. The girl knew that her friends, though they had decided not to ask her, were still burning with curiosity. They would want to know what she had seen. Celine felt better as they approached the shore. Let's not talk about it, okay? She said, I just can't tell you. I don't know what words to use, but it's there, or something is there, but it's there. Katie must have been offended. It was the first time Selena had ever kept a secret from her. And it's a big one. But in all fairness, Katie was the one who made it all up. And she should have seen what Selena did. However, the friend looked bad. It was clear that Alinka was not pretending there, white as a wall. And Katie, with great difficulty for herself, but decided really not to question her about anything. The next morning, everyone pretended that there had been no ghost hunt. So what if they went to Rosdesvinsko? It was only a short drive from home. John arranged with some of the locals, and they were driven back by car. In the light of day, what had happened the day before seemed equally unreal to both John and Katie. Selena was silent, and it was impossible to know what she was thinking. From that day on, she remained strangely silent, thinking bitterly that she must have inherited her mother's psyche. Once a major upheaval had happened in her life, she had gone. Selena no longer agreed to any of Shenka's projects, and all the Merston housework. Good, it was enough. Selen attended the vegetable garden. On some days she helped her mother on the farm, on others she cleaned and cooked. But in the evenings, Ariana was reluctant to send her daughter out for a walk with Katie. Often John joined their company. He had gotten a bicycle, and now he had no trouble getting to his girlfriend's house. The girls showed him all the protected corners, all the places in the neighborhood that they loved so much. It was always easy for the three of them. They never quarreled, and Katie confided at home that she was already waiting for the next day to come and they would meet again and go out together. You're in love, I guess, Mom suggested. Katie just shrugged her shoulders. She told John Selena's story, taking the boy at his word not to do anything without consulting her. But it's so easy to decide. John was agitated. I could talk at the boarding school myself, but it's better. Father's coming to pick me up in mid-August to stay here for a few days. Aunt Elizabeth is his sister. They don't see each other much. We'll all go to the boarding school together and solve this issue. We'll knock the principal on the head. Don't be frightened. I'm speaking figuratively. And it all worked out. Selena didn't believe it at first. John's father, a very serious, imposing middle-aged man, a lawyer of a large company, just started talking as the principal, who Selena was so afraid of, immediately began to nod and agree to everything. Of course, of course, I understand. The girl will be better at home. All that was left to do was sign the papers, pick up the documents and bow out. Jack's father was in the car, so they took Selena's things at once. 
The girl looked at her empty bed and nightstand and thought that it was as if she had never lived here. Ariana was happy to the point of tears and felt guilty that she hadn't had the courage to take her daughter earlier. The girlfriends now went to high school together. In the few years that passed before graduation, their friendship with John had not been interrupted. While the guy studied at the institute, he regularly came for summer and winter vacations, and together they had fun like children. They even went down the slide, and Katie laughed so hard that it was hard to stop her. John was equally attentive to both girls, but Selena knew in her heart that she was going to give in to Katie. Her friend was falling more and more in love. Selena had her own secret, which she did not share with anyone but her mother. Mom, she asked Ariana, do we have any fortune tellers in our family? Her mother had been sewing, and now she put the unfinished work on her lap. Not that I know of, she said, thinking, why? You know I'm even afraid to talk about it. I see bad things sometimes now. Well, like, if a person is going to die soon, I see through his real face another one, waxen dead, and the eyes are closed. It's like the pictures are superimposed on each other. I've lost my mind and now I'll be locked up not in a boarding school, but in a hospital, right? In an asylum? The last spring the girls spent at school came. Katie was ready to surrender to the inscrutability of the exact sciences. I'll only take basic math, she said angrily. A fool can figure it out. I'll never need those discriminants and other nonsense anyway. She was going to theater school. No, not in some university known throughout the country and in the studio at the regional drama theater. As for appearance, Katie did not meet the expectations that used to put on her parents. Now it was clear that grew a gray sparrow. Average height stubby until she began to talk, remained unremarkable, but Katie rarely spoke. What a common appearance, what's the big deal? She smorted, she smorted, not gray, but universal. I can be made up to look like anyone, and then I'm not going to the movies or close-ups. Who's going to get a close-up look at me from the auditorium, except through binoculars? She didn't seem to have any doubts that she'd get in. Selena, on the other hand, was quietly sad. Not only her best friend, but all her classmates were discussing where they would apply after graduation. They were trying to get caught up, if not in a technical school, then at least in some courses. Nobody was going to stay in the village. Selena had nothing else to do. Her mom was giving up more and more, and more than once she woke her daughter up in the middle of the night. Sit with me for a while. I don't feel well. Selena measured her mother's blood pressure, put medicine in a shot glass, took pills out of the medicine cabinet. She was desperate for mom to keep working. Her mother rested as long as she could and hurried back to her animals. As soon as Selena had a spare moment, she would rush to help. But mom couldn't find any other work. There was just no work. Besides, the food that appeared on their table was also from the farm, a great help. So Selena knew that she couldn't go anywhere after school, at least not yet. And if her mother talked to her about her future plans, the girl only joked about it. Katie, obeying an innate sense of contradiction, on the graduation party came in a pantsuit. Selena helped Selena help the neighbor she kept a beautiful dressed daughter, which she also wore to the graduation. So what if the outfit is a little outdated? Youth supplemented the missing and Selena looked adorable. A few days later, she was seeing her friend off. Parents rented an apartment near the theater for their only daughter, so that the girl had all the conditions to prepare for the exams. If she gets in, she'll live there from now on. And you'll come and visit me, Kathy. Stingy with tenderness. Hut, Selena. You're so sure you'll get in. You bet, I know where I belong. And Katie did get in. She rarely called Selena. Both girls were busy, as they say, over the top, and in the evenings they could barely make it to bed. But God knows how Katie's life was going. Selena, on the other hand, was up bright and early. A sweatshirt, rubber boots, manure, feed, and a thousand things you can't avoid if you work with animals. The farmer was very pleased. Selena turned out to be an industrious and skillful worker, and financially the small family's life became a little easier. Autumn brought with it a dreariness, especially when November took over. The nature around looked quite bleak. Slush, cold, and long dark evenings. And if Celine hadn't been blessed with a rich imagination, she would have been sad. And she also fell in love with goats, noticing that each one had its own special character. 
The girl recognized the pets even by their voices, and when she came to the farm in the morning, the horned pets greeted her joyfully. Her mother, though she was not feeling well, did not want to retire. I will not sit on your neck, she told her daughter. I have a long way to go before retirement. I'll leave at least milking for myself. Still, it's not hands the machine. That talent of Selena, which awoke after the adventures in the old house, developed more and more. Sometimes she herself did not notice that when she met with acquaintances, and in the village practically everyone knew each other, she threw some phrases that were surprisingly accurate in predicting the future. A neighbor would complain that she couldn't sell her house, and Selena would casually say, You don't have to sell it. It's gonna take everyone in. And it turns out in a short time that the neighbor's daughter divorces her husband, takes the children, and comes to her mother. Another woman will share that her back hurts, she can't stand it anymore, and she would hear Selena's advice to go to church on Sunday. She did not want to go, the woman had long ago stopped attending church, and did not hope for help from above. But at the service she unexpectedly met an old acquaintance with her daughter, and the daughter turned out to be a doctor, working in the city in the hospital. She called the patient to come and promise to help. Selena's gift was first noticed by her fellow villagers and more and more often began to turn to her for advice. The girl herself was terribly embarrassed and was ready to deny everything. How could she know what would happen next? It just seems so to her, and she does not claim any truth in the last instance. Her mother insisted that on New Year's vacation the girl went to the city to a friend. Substitute you. Nothing will happen to me, she persuaded, if you do not agree then make me worse. I'll think I'm eating up your life. Mom, what are you saying? Live a young girl's life for a while. Go to the movies with Katie. Go shopping. Here, I put some money aside for you. Selena wanted to say bitterly that she wouldn't need the good stuff. Not to go to the cattle, perfumed with French perfume or waving an expensive purse. But she kept silent, realizing that she would upset her mother even more. Still, she gave in to her entreaties and bought a bus ticket. Katie met her at the station, unrecognizable. It was a warm winter, and her friend was wearing a light coat and a cap of unimaginable style. Katie had never worn high-heeled boots before, but they were terribly happy to see each other, and they were hugging each other. I could hardly get away, said Katie. You're the ones who have days off on New Year's Eve, but we're busy. We, the students, put on a play based on fairy tales, and now we're on stage every night. Kids, holidays, Christmas trees. Her friend's apartment struck Selena, seemed luxurious. How easy it must be to live like this. To make toast in the morning, take out of the refrigerator yogurt, brew coffee in an elegant turbine, and in the evening to lie in a shining bath, and then settle down in this cozy chair with a book in his hands. There's such a thing in the world. Katie took her friend to rehearsal and then to the play. And although Selena was far from all this theater life, she felt that the main wealth for Kathy, here on this stage. To Selena's surprise, her friend played the steadfast tin soldier, but she was only surprised for the first minute, and then she was completely mesmerized by the tale. It's really yours, she said to her friend after the performance. I had tears in my eyes. Katie wrinkled her nose. We were afraid. The holidays, the kids. You need a fun story and we've taken on such lyrics, but that's okay, even kids need to know the ins and outs of life, and in the end, soldier boy and dancer, though burned in the flames, stayed together. Is it so bad to be burned by love? Then she looked at Selena with a sidelong glance and added, tomorrow is my day off after all. I'll get John to drive us around the city. I was afraid to ask you about him. I thought you were together, and you still haven't said a word about him. You two haven't had a fight. Not once, you're here from morning till night, you don't realize the rhythm of life here. Then you realize, oh, we haven't seen each other for a month. Later Selena couldn't forget that day. John had picked up the girls in the morning. They were in a country park, admiring the snowy winter, drinking mulled wine in a small cafe. Then Kathy and John organized a real excursion for Selena, showed her the city in a way that no tour guide could do. And here I bought my pearl earrings in this store, Katie said. It was the first cold day of autumn. I was going to buy my shoes for the season. I looked in the jewelry store only for a minute, saw these earrings and couldn't resist. And here, girls, you can go up on the roof of an old house and look down on the city. 
Would you like that? John suggested it. In the evening, they sat late at Katie's house, drinking coffee, and Selena listened avidly to her friend's stories about what had happened to them over the months. She had nothing to tell them herself. Well, she got stronger a little, sacks of mixed fodder alone carries from the gate to the barn. Well, her favorite goat gave birth to four baby goats. Are they interested in that? Then it turned out that John thought Selena had come for the whole New Year's holiday, but she was only off for three days, so they didn't really get to say goodbye. The next morning, when the guy called Katie and asked where they wanted to go today, it turned out that Selena was on the first flight out, and Katie had a rehearsal. It was a damn shame, and the guy was upset. Why didn't you tell me? I would have walked her to the train station. I thought you knew, Katie said. The next time the friends might not see each other until summer at the earliest, but already in the spring Selena started having strange dreams, or rather, the same dream that repeated itself from night to night. She was in Rosdisvensko again, and she was walking along the riverbank. The banks here were sandy. Year after year, the river washed up the slopes, changing their relief. And now the edge of an old, abandoned cemetery was exposed, where no one had been buried for a long time. In her dreams, Celine walked along this shore, agonizingly trying to figure out what she needed to find. What was it? But the morning came when she woke up, knowing exactly what she had to do. In Rosdisvensko, there was a small museum, which for a long time could not think of a name. And finally, they christened it the Museum of Peasant Life. Here was collected that told about the life of peasants in the past centuries. Troughs and spinning wheels, tools, cradles for babies, embroidery, icons. And of course, the only woman who worked here, both as director and tour guide, knew the history of the old manor. Celine went to her. Maria, she said, what will be done with the old cemetery? Her companion understood her half-wordedly. Our priest has long said that the remains should be collected and buried in the new cemetery, albeit in a common mass grave, buried and honored. It is necessary. Celine did not take her serious gaze away from her. I know why no crypt was found in the manor. But Al, Maria even took off her spectacles as if she thought she could see the girl better that way. There are no documents, nothing. Countess Catherine longed for her dead son and really tried to communicate with his soul in some way. Maybe it developed some natural ability she had. Today, she would be called clairvoyant. Back then, the peasants called her a witch. She did die young. She was poisoned. Her husband had long since forgotten to think of her, and she was buried here, in an unmarked grave outside the cemetery. And the remains of her son, the witch's beast, were moved there, and the crypt was leveled. Is that a legend? Did one of the locals tell you? Selena shook her head. It's true. There's still an oak tree there, and next to it is that grave. We have to do something. It took a while to get the old cemetery moved, but Maria still managed to convince the authorities. She found arguments. Summer is approaching, the warm season. Both summer residents and tourists will come to Rostisvensko. And the beach can't be open like this. Who will like the neighborhood with crumbling earth and remains of burials? The work took about a month, and when it was finished, Selena felt an unprecedented peace of mind. She knew that Maria had finally believed her. The workers had found the grave of a woman and a child by the oak tree. Selena had no doubt who it was. If only the old manor could be restored, but that was no longer in her power. And at the beginning of the summer, quite unexpectedly, a matchmaker came to Selena. At first, she and her mother didn't even understand what was wrong. This woman, Naomi, they knew well, but this time she was accompanied by two men. I found you a bridegroom, Naomi said. Almost from the doorstep, a bridegroom like you'll envy yourself. But I'm not getting married. Selena didn't know whether to laugh or be angry. Listen to me. He's got his own company that makes these bags. He's got everything. You should see the house. It's a palace. The only thing is, Naomi hesitated. He's in his 70s. But that's nothing. Nonsense. I told him about you. I praised you. You're smart and beautiful. And you have a gift from God. You can see the future. So, I brought you good news. Selena turned to her mother, hoping that she would help her out of her ridiculous situation. And froze. On her mother's face, she saw a familiar death mask. Cardiogram. A nightmare. Trustingly shared with Selena girl therapist. 
She was small, overweight, a kind of kalobak. Why, you, woman, so many health problems, and even at the dispensary has not been once. I wasn't complaining. No, Ariana hasn't changed a bit. As soon as they raised their voices at her or began to reproach her for something, she immediately began to make frightened excuses. I wasn't complaining. In any case, you need to come to the clinic at least a couple times a year. I had such patients. They say that everything is fine, but look at the cardiogram, and there are flags, the therapist sighed, well, in the hospital will be registered. No, Ariana was scared again. We will, Selena said firmly, Mom. I don't know how they'll treat you there, but in any case, you won't go off to milking or weeding. I know you. You will be examined in peace, supported her therapist, injections, procedures. You need treatment for a long time, as you do not understand it. In short, I write a referral, and tomorrow morning you come, with a rope, slippers, toiletries. At home, Ariana cried all the time. She hadn't been in a hospital since she was a child. Don't put me there. I won't come back, she kept repeating. Selena silently gathered her mother's things. Speaking was difficult for her, her throat constricted. So far, no one she had seen the seal on had escaped their fate. Would she be able to save her mom? She would do anything for that. The farmer for whom Ariana had worked for so many years showed sympathy the next morning by driving them to the hospital in his car. Otherwise, they would have had to take a crowded bus. A few days passed in anxiety, doubt, uncertainty. Selena struggled to find time to visit her mother every day. Then the attending physician invited her to visit her. You realize that the district hospital doesn't have a lot of resources, she said, and there's not much we can do for your mother. But I don't know how long that'll last. Some kind of stress, hypertension, whatever, and the end could be anything, including the saddest. And there's absolutely nothing that can be done. Selena was desperate. Your mom needs to go to a full-fledged cardiology, to the regional hospital at least. But I don't know if the head of the department will give a referral. She's, how can I put this delicately? She's weird. She always thinks we can do it on our own. I'm sorry to be so blunt. A lot of doctors have left here. I remember one patient. They told him he needed this amount of money so we could really help you. Sell the garage, we'll cure you. And he took pity on the garage, decided to raise a pig, then sell the meat, get the money he needed. Lost a year, died. Perhaps we should complain. I want someone who is stubborn and persistent to see it through to the end. Unfortunately, not everyone has time to wait until the complaint is considered, until the measures are taken. And what kind of measures will these measures be? In many ways, our superiors have everything in hand. The most harmless in this regard is our old therapist. People come to him to call him home to a sick person. He says, if you pour me a drink, I'll come in. In short, I realize that we can't do without money, without a decent sum. That's life. The doctor said sadly, in any case, if you have a seriously ill patient at home, you will need money. Whether you will seek a referral or want to pay for treatment, still without spending will not do without spending. All the way home, Selena rubbed her forehead with the palm of her hand. She and her mom tried to save money for a rainy day, but it was ridiculous to even talk about the amount they had saved. Should I try to borrow money from someone? But how would they pay it back? Selena knew how much she could earn even if she tried her best. Going into a lot of debt was unrealistic. What else? Sell the house? That would be enough money for a short-term cure. But Selena knew how many houses in the village had for sale, written on the gate or on the fence. No one was in a hurry to buy. Arriving at the empty house, she texted Ku Katie, outlining the situation in a nutshell. Don't tell John, she asked. The young man is a real gentleman, as they used to say. He will try to help in some way, but Selena and her mother are strangers to him, and there is nothing to involve a good man in this hard story. And in the morning, exhausted from doubts and fighting with herself, Selena called the very Valentina, who wanted to be a matchmaker. This old man of yours who wants to marry me, will he give money for my mom's treatment? If he does, I'll marry him now. Isn't that what they called an unequal marriage in the old days? Selena stood in front of the mirror, adjusting the folds of her wedding dress. The last few weeks had been so hard on her that she didn't know she could take it. 
Naomi had been terribly happy when she called. She said that she would find out everything and call back, but she was more than sure that the groom would not refuse. And when the call came a few hours later, the matchmaker's voice was more than triumphant. It turns out that the old man cannot just give money. He knows well the head of the cardiology department in the regional hospital. You could say, friends, you won't cheat me, Selena asked. Everything was hanging by a thread for her now, and there was nothing left but to believe these strangers. At the very least, they would just use her like a thing. But for now, there was hope. The gift that she had so unexpectedly received and that had never let her down all this time was suddenly gone. Selena could no longer see the beyond, could no longer see into the future. She still visited her mother every day, but she never mentioned her wedding to her. If my mom heard about the 70-year-old groom, it would kill her. She'd have to find out about the whole thing when the treatment was over. The only thing that worried her was that the fiancé was in no hurry to see her. He saw you, Naomi said meaningfully, and he liked you a lot. He's still a very busy man. Every minute counts. He's coming straight to the registry office. Selene is just a wreck. In her heart, she'd hoped that she would have time not only to get acquainted with her future husband, but also to become attached to him. She would try her best to find good traits in him. Having lived all her life in the village, the girl had seen an example of such a marriage. Rich by local standards, not an old man, he had and northern shares, and an apartment in the city, which he rented, and an excellent two-story house above the lake, married a young woman with two children. In the village about this Katya went not too good fame, and she is self-serving and ready to go with the first man, if it will bring her some benefit. And this marriage did not end well. Katya's husband raised and educated foster children. To provide the family with everything that Katya wanted, he gradually sold in shares and his other property. City apartments signed over to his stepdaughters, the house bequeathed to his young wife, not his children from his first marriage. Is it a sorceress, this Catherine? Whispered fellow villagers, why did she take him? After all, as they say, neither skin nor skin. And the old man was completely out of his mind with her. Well, maybe when he'll die, the young wife will take care of him. At least she'll do her duty. In the end, the old man took his own life. No one knew for sure what caused it. Catherine grieved for show, with sobs and lamentations, but quickly after that became a laughing young widow, quite satisfied with life. I would not be like that, thought Selena. If this man had helped my mother and treated me well, I would have done everything for him. And if he got sick, I'd take care of him, even if it was for years. And I would never cheat on him. But the fact that the groom did not even bother to get acquainted with her, it emphasized that Selena is just bought and it is unlikely that in this marriage she is waiting for something good. Naomi took the girl's measurements and brought her a wedding dress from the city, sewn in an expensive salon. And the rings will be at the groom's, she said. In the morning we take you out of the house, take you to the city, there you will sign. If you want to take something from the things, collect in advance, I'll take to the place where you will live. Selena hurried to say, it was important for her. There would be no guests from her side. And of course, no traditional redemption or other wedding entertainment. The car would arrive, the bride would get out, and that was all. The girl did not leave the thought that she was doing something unimaginable wrong. If it was not so, of course, she would have called Jenka, and her mother would be sitting at the wedding table next to her. Now she's doing everything furtively, definitely running away. What's my way out? yelled Selena to herself. There were no options, so she would have to pull herself together and never show what was on her mind. For some reason, the hardest thing to deal with was the thought that John would find out soon enough. He would realize at once that she had sold herself, and of course he would never want to do business with her again. The night before the wedding Selena had not slept, and in the morning she was exhausted. She styled her own hair, and suddenly the hairdryer electrocuted her. Everything in the old house was slowly breaking down. She and her mom had been planning to change the wiring for a long time. This electric shock, not so strong, but nevertheless, it was the last straw. Selena sat with her hands over her face, crying and unable to stop. With only an hour to go before the agreed upon time, she rushed to clean herself up. She tucked her lush hair into a heavy knot, 
put on a little makeup with her cheap cosmetics, and then, without help, put on a lush wedding dress decorated with pearls. I involuntarily remembered Jenka. She was very fond of pearls, and from these memories tears came to her eyes again. At last a car drove up to the house, black, shining, the like of which had probably never been seen on their village street. Naomi went into the house and took a quick look at the girl. She was good. Why are you so pale? I'll give you some cognac. I'll give you some cognac. It's angelic tears, not booze. She took out a full bottle of expensive cognac from somewhere in her bag. Apparently she herself had tasted it many times in the morning. She looked for a shot glass, didn't find one, poured the cognac directly into a cup. Half a drink. And Selena, who had never drunk hard liquor in her life, drank it all with her eyes squeezed shut. Perhaps it was a gesture of desperation. Everything will be all right, the matchmaker said encouragingly. The car had a soft ride. It was definitely flying over the road. Selena watched the familiar villages flash by the window. Here was the district center, where her mother was lying in the hospital. Selena had warned her the day before that she wouldn't come tomorrow, but she would have to call her, just to get a moment. The girl clutched the phone as tightly as if it were her only link to her old life. In the city, they drove up to a small registry office on the outskirts, and Selena wondered why here. If the groom was a rich and powerful man, one could assume that they would be waiting for some pompous ceremony in the palace of marriage. Our groom doesn't like too much fuss, Naomi said. They'll sign you, then you'll take pictures, and then you'll go to a restaurant. He's rented a whole country estate. You'll spend the night there, and tomorrow you'll celebrate the second date as you should. Selena only nodded. She had long ago told herself that she would not oppose the groom in any way. She had one condition, and she hoped he would fulfill it and the rest was unimportant. They stood in the lobby in a small group. Only Naomi was cheerful, making jokes now and then. The two young men seemed to be waiting for something, most likely a chance to sit down at a well-set table and have a drink. And when an older man approached Selena, she realized that he was her future husband. His hair was already quite gray, his mustache and beard neatly trimmed. He shook her hand and smiled affectionately. The whole wedding ceremony was like a dream. They were signed without unnecessary pomp, said a few duty high-minded words about the birth of a new family. Selena hid her face in the bouquet of roses that the groom presented to her and tried to hold back her tears. Thank God, they were not forced to dance the first marital waltz, and when the new husband was offered to kiss his wife, apparently feeling something, the old man only delicately pecked Selena on the cheek. Then they were taken to a country restaurant, it was one of the best places in town. The old house now served as a hotel, and here they celebrated holidays. There were many secluded nooks and crannies. Hunting Lodge, Japanese gazebo, English garden. So any, the largest company, could be divided into groups, and guests could spend time with those with whom they wanted. There were already considerably more guests here. Strangers came up to Selena, hugging her, smiling, telling her how lucky she was and how lucky her husband was. She only nodded, but her pallor and extinguished look was conspicuous. Sneaking out onto the balcony, she called her mother, and she said that the head of the department came to her today, was unusually kind, and promised that one day she would send her mother to the regional hospital. Such people have taken care of you, she said. After this conversation, Selena changed, so it had not all been in vain. Her fiancé, no, her husband, keeps his word, and she would try to thank him to do her best. The girl's back straightened, her chin was lifted up, and a gleam appeared in her eyes. The groom seemed to look at her surprised. But all things come to an end, and the moment came when the young ones were taken to the luxurious wedding suite. Selena remembered that there even seemed to be a picture like this. The bride pressed her hand to her forehead, as if emphasizing her despair and in the bedroom door stands an impatient elderly groom. No, she herself would not cry again. And the girl took up the zipper of the heavy wedding dress. You wait to undress, said the husband. Selena looked at him with bewilderment. Do one, do two, do three. A gray wig, mustache and beard lay on the dressing table, and Kathy was already wiping makeup off her face. You really didn't guess, she asked with genuine interest. 
Selena realized that it wasn't her mother, but herself, who was about to have a heart attack. She just opened her mouth. How? How? She could only say it a few moments later. You're such a clumsy motherfucker. Katie sat down beside her. Oh, that paint, it's going to take two hours to wash my face off. You think we didn't find out? You don't think they'd be all over the place in my village? You're a naive daisy. I knew all about your mother and your adventure, and I couldn't leave it like that. But the registry office, how did they manage to pull it off? So what? So it's a bummer for my mom, no one to help her. Who the hell did I marry? Calm down, Katie got serious. Hey, hey, you just don't take a swing at me. Mom's gonna be fine. She's actually being transferred here to the med center tomorrow. She's already shown all the transcripts to the doctors. They'll do the surgery and it'll be like our gym teacher said, chicky chicky. And you got married. Well, I got you drunk on Konak, well done. I thought you wouldn't take it. You married John, my dear. Didn't you listen when the lady at the registry office read the names? I just realized my husband's name was John and I thought, what a coincidence. And his father is friends with the head of cardiology, so no cheating on the most important thing. And we talked the registry office into it for a fee. Katie. I know who's behind this whole scheme. I'm gonna kick your ass. Hey, crazy horse, don't swing that pillow around. I know you pulled and pull otherwise. Oh, John, I can't marry you. My mom's sick. It's my moral obligation to carry feed to the pigs and clean the stable. I should have had you married right away. You can get a divorce if you want, though. We didn't take you prisoner after all. Selena threw away the pillow she'd been trying to smother her friend with, sat red-faced, disheveled and blew her hair off her forehead. Anyway, I'm calling John, okay? You can take your clothes off or not, it's up to you. I'm gonna go get the champagne. My friends, if you'll notice, I haven't eaten a thing today because I'm nervous, so I'm hungry and sober, which is a dangerous combination. If anyone had looked into the wedding suite that night, they would have seen the marvelous combination of three friends asleep on the king's bed without undressing, and smiles wandered across the faces of all three. Selena's mother spent two months in the hospital. She did have the necessary surgery, but the doctor's prognosis was most optimistic. Of course, it was out of the question for the woman to return to her former job. But in the regional theater of opera and ballet found a place for her in the costume room. Sue fabulously beautiful costumes, it was what she dreamed of all her life, and where her talent manifested itself. John by this time had already graduated from law school, he had a good apartment, where he brought Selena. The young man worked in a large company and here he had a chance to make a career. Selena entered the institute. Now she had at least a few years of carefree youth ahead of her, which fate had always denied her before. Only one thing happened during those months. Selena was told that her own father was looking for her. A distant relative called her and asked to meet her. You see, his life didn't work out, she said. He started drinking. No one expected this. There are no alcoholics in his family. No one understood why he was addicted to alcohol or how serious it was. But the further it went, the worse it got. His second wife tried to treat him in one drug treatment center in another, but he could only hold out for so long. Eventually, she packed up and left. He tried to get her back, had a few ugly scandals. He said she used him, an old man, and then left him. She replied that she did not want to finally ruin her young years living together with an alcoholic. Took the kids and left. As you can see, there's nothing left of his farm. But the worst thing is that your father began to go blind. Anyway, now he's an invalid. He still has some money in his book and he wants to give it to you and apologize. He says he feels bad for you. Maybe that's why things went wrong for him. Will you talk to him? Selena was quiet. He doesn't have to apologize to me as much as he does to my mother, she said. He's more to blame for her. I don't need his money. The thing is, I don't know where to put him now, the relative confessed. He can't live alone. He would be taken to a nursing home. But you know, they have places for those who have their own place. And your father's wife took everything away from him. He has a room in a former dormitory, eight meters, and the ceiling is leaking. Leaving him there means he'll just leave in a few months even if the social worker starts bringing your father food. There are enough alcoholics around, they'll carry everything. And I can't take him in, I just had a daughter. There was silence again. 
probably the relative decided that Selena should be greased. You see how everything in life comes back, she said in a heartful tone, at one time your father left you, and now he himself no one needs. Probably, as long as he has to live there, he will repent that he did that to you and your mom. Life is like a boomerang, everyone knows that. He's got a nice pension. Why don't you think of a way to make it work for your dad? You don't have a little room where he could lie down. You married a rich man, didn't you? I'll see what I can do, Selena said discreetly. And of course they discussed it with John in the evening. I know you're very kind, said her husband, but you've given so many years to others. You've never lived the life you wanted to live. And now I can see it in your eyes. You're ready to throw away more time on a man who put you in boarding school and never visited you. I'm not gonna let that happen. We'll figure something out. A week later, he found a place in an old people's home. It was a private institution, modest but clean and inexpensive. Old people lived in a room of four people. They were not only fed and looked after their health, but even entertained. There was a music hall here. School children came with concerts. Now you will be calm for him, John said, and your conscience will not gnaw at you. And to visit him. You know, I don't want to, Selena admitted. He's been a stranger to me for a long time. Katie was finishing her studies at the theater studio, where she was rightly considered a star. Selena often thought how great it is when a person is in love with his work and sincerely ready to devote his life to it. However, part of this life Kathy was ready to spend on something else. Together with Selena, she visited her mother in the hospital, and there she met a young doctor. And apparently, their relationship was developing rapidly. As for future roles, now Selena was sure Katie could play anything. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.